Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We were a few minutes late. Sam thought that I uh, meant 8 o'clock Chicago time, as if I would mean Chicago time. Um, but we are here now. Uh, and, and in fact, Sam, you didn't even have to, you didn't even have to say, uh, yo, I thought it was Chicago time. You could just say, Hey, I'm a, I'm a Syrian, right? That's right. <laughs> That's we're how we roll. Uh, pe people already posted in the comments section. Uh, he's on a Syrian time. So yeah, you're, 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 you're good to go. People are, are forgiving of, uh, your shortcomings. Praise God. Praise Jesus for <laughs> grace and mercy and patience, man. I need it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh. Everyone go out here at the beginning. We usually uh, just chat for a few minutes here at the beginning while everyone logs on. Um, everyone be sure to hit that like button. Yep. People don't know the likes actually affect the YouTube algorithm on who uh, who the video gets shared with and stuff like that. So uh, more likes equals uh, more uh, interactions. And the YouTube algorithm uh, reads that as, hey, people are interacting more with this video, so they're liking it more, so let me share this video with more people. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone uh, hit the like button, and I'm going to go ahead and share this on Facebook right now, telling everyone we're live, we're going to be answering questions. Uh, some of you were on, <laughs> some of you were on in the middle of the night. I don't, I don't know if you know this, Sam, but uh, Vocab and I, because I stay up all night on weekends, um, Vocab and I will, will get on in the middle of the night and just go live at like 2 o'clock in the morning. We're on from like 2 o'clock past 5 o'clock uh, in the morning. So that was that was actually this morning and uh, told everyone to come back here for some questions with Sam and Dave here. All right, buddy. You're insomniacs, baby. I can't hang. That's how we roll. That's how we roll. <clears throat> yeah. Got it, brother. So I'm ready. Come on. Any tough questions? Come on, Muhammad Hijab. I need a free Arabic lesson. <clears throat> Now, um, I told, I told someone, I told someone in the last chat, the last, last night when we were chatting, um, with vocab, uh, you're not going to believe this, Sam. Yeah. But, uh, we had some topics that we were addressing, vocab and I, and, uh, we ended up talking about how the Quran affirms the inspiration and preservation and authority of the gospel. And there was a Muslim in the chat who said he could easily refute me with no preparation. And so I actually stopped everything and I said, okay, let's just interact with this. Go ahead and give me your refutation. And he did a horrible, horrible, horrible job, though he was trying. He was, he was given the standard Muslim responses. He was, aha, you think that Injil means the gospel that you guys have and not something else, right? So he's, he's responding like that. Um, basic, basic stuff. Um, so I was responding to that, and you're not going to believe this. The other Muslims who were in the chat were doing everything they could to change the subject. Whatever topic we were addressing, okay. they kept trying to change the subject. Have, can you even believe this? Can you believe that they would not want to address that very, very important subject and would immediately want to change the subject to something else? Most definitely, I believe they'll do that because they know, <clears throat> as you and I both know, the Quran <clears throat> is... A witness against them and a witness for us. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure you already mentioned it to the people. <clears throat> we don't quote the Quran because we care for what the Quran says. Muhammad could say the Bible is the uncorrupt revelations of God and history prove he's wrong because he's a false prophet after all. But since the Muslims swear by Muhammad, that means they're bound to believe whatever he affirms, whatever he believed, whatever he denied. And the problem for the Muslim, and they're beginning to see it, if they haven't seen it already, is that the Quran nowhere says the previous scriptures have been corrupted <clears throat> beyond recognition. In fact, the Quran goes out of its way to say that those scriptures are in the possession of the Jews and Christians, and Jews and Christians are to live according to those scriptures and even use those scriptures to judge Muhammad. Mm -hmm. There's no way around this. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. You can't get around it. So uh, that's what we were we were talking about. And that's what I, I, I think we spent probably 35, 40 minutes discussing this topic, giving the Muslim every opportunity to respond to this, to show how we're misinterpreting these scriptures in the Quran. And the other Muslims just kept trying to change the subject. And so when they were changing the subject, I said, look, if you want to address that, we'll do that in the next show. As for right now, we're focusing on this because this Muslim said that he could, he, he could refute me easily. 
And then he kept saying he could only do it uh, live and kept telling me to have him on uh, live right then, knowing that you can't just click a button and then he's somehow live. Um, yep. So uh, anyway, gave him chance after chance after chance after chance after chance to show anything was out of context because that, that was that's what he said. Ah, you're, you're taking these things out of context. Can you believe this, Sam? Can you believe that there's a, a defense called the context defense where any passage yeah. that you quote from the Quran, no matter how clearly it says it, yeah. Muslims will just say, oh, context, and think that they've refuted you? Did yeah. you know this? No, I'm learning this. This is the first time I've heard this argument in over, what, over 20 years of debating Muslims? That's yeah. a new one to me. I've never heard the out of context canard. That's a new one. By the way, side note, uh -huh. the Muslims will tell you that the Quran confirms the original Torah given to Moses. Mm -hmm. And here's what I want the Christians to do anytime, anytime you hear a Muslim say to you, that we affirm the original Torah given to Moses, you challenge them. Show me a single verse in the entire Quran that says the Torah was given to Moses. Mm -hmm. Doesn't say that. So where are you getting the idea that the Torah was given to Moses? You must be getting it from the Bible. But once you turn to the Bible to try to confirm that the Torah, which the Arabic Quran calls Torah, <clears throat> Hebrew's Torah instructions, once you appeal to the Bible to show that the Torah was given to the Moses to Moses, you're stuck because mm -hmm. that same scripture say that the Torah that Moses received is none other than the Pentateuch. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to go that route now, do you? Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to the Hadiths, the Hadiths are way later than the Quran, and they're dependent on what they were getting from the Jews and Christians, which induces another problem. For example, you and I both know this: the Hadith in Sunan Abu Dawood, mm -hmm. where Muhammad asked the Jews for a copy of their Torah. And when they gave him, gave him that Torah, that copy, he placed on a cushion that he was sitting on. And he looked at it and said, I believe in you and him who revealed you. So we know historically that the only Torah the Jews would have had, or a copy of the Torah that they would have had, is what we possess today. Because we have manuscripts before, during, after Muhammad. And it's identical to the Pentateuch. Mm -hmm. So there's no way of escaping. You want to go mm -hmm. to that deed? You prove the Pentateuch is the Torah given to Moses. You want to go to the Bible? You prove that the Pentateuch is the Torah given to Moses. Mm -hmm. You can't escape it. It's it's just you can't. Mm -hmm. No way around it. All right. Well, I did uh, I did tell um, the Muslim who's trying to change the subject that we would uh, start out here by addressing the topic that that he wanted to address. And I have to say, he's going to have you stumped here, Sam. He's going to have okay. you really stumped. Uh, before well, we do that, just so we don't get too far behind uh, on comments here, Lily R says, uh, "God bless you, David and Sam." I think it should be Sam and Dave, just because. Do you even remember those guys, Sam? Do you remember Sam and Dave? Remember Are those Soul Man? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm no, no, no. Soul Man, man. You never heard "I'm a Soul Man"? <laughs> da -da 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 -da. Yeah, that 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 group was. I, I think that was Sam and. I think that that group was called Sam and Dave. Um, someone else wanted us to mention that you're going to be on Tuesday with Al Fadi. Is that correct? Yeah, Al Fadi is going to be doing some live shows. I'm going to be with him. So okay, hopefully good. next time you'll join us like you did last time. So, hopefully. so, uh, so are these. This is going to be on on where on his YouTube channel or on Facebook yes. or where? Facebook, I think, and he's going to probably do YouTube live. He's going to give the announcements, I think, tomorrow. God willing, Lord okay. willing. Okay. Yeah. And so. Uh, so that would be. Well, so someone someone just go to uh, get get uh, the link to El Fadi's um, Facebook page where he's going to be and uh, post it over here for those who want to tune in. Um, all right, well let's go ahead and get started. You're Sam. scaring me. Hmm? You're scaring me. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to give yeah. you I'm going to give you this Muslim's object objection. All right. Now you've got a problem because you believe in the deity of Christ, but there are passages that completely contradict this belief. Right, and I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. And uh, sure. I haven't looked through all of the uh, chat comments here, but I hope uh, he's back so he can go ahead and uh, uh, I think his name is Muhammad. So he can go ahead and uh, see Sam's faith in Jesus Destroy. crumble upon the strength of this objection. So here it was, right? Okay. <laughs> you're not going to believe this, Sam, because you're not familiar with your own scriptures. But in John, the book of John, you know, there's a book of John in the Bible, right? I thought it was the book of uh, Thomas. Are you sure you ain't getting the two confused? Yeah, yeah. My so anyway, in the book of John, chapter 20, right? <laughs> yeah. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. <gasps> and he says, 
Chapter 20, <laughs> verse 17. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, Sam, you believe that Jesus is God. How can God have a God? This would clearly be polytheism. You yeah. clearly have not understood your own scriptures or the very words of Jesus found in your scriptures. Yeah, Are you me. ready to now renounce Christianity and accept the pure oneness of God that we find I'm in Al-Islam? To take the Shahada. There is no God but Jehovah. And there, and Jesus Christ is Jehovah's eternal Son who became flesh. See, that's it. I took my Shahada, right? Yeah. No. No. That, that, that's anyway. First of all, what I like to do is not just provide an answer to the objection, but also show how that same passage or argument can be turned against Islam to prove Islam is false, so that this argument proves too much. Because I want everyone, because Dave knows this, Anthony Rogers knows this vocab. If it was just Dave and I, I wouldn't even waste my time because I'd be preaching to the choir. He knows this. He can do a much better job defending it. But for the benefit of the Christians, that's why we're doing this, to equip you, our brothers and sisters in Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to answer these objections with the hopes that Muslims will awaken to the truth of Christ. Now, notice Jesus said that the one who happens to be his God and the God of all true believers is the Father. Right there you have a problem, David, because according to the Quran... Allah is a, Allah is a father, right? Definitely not. He's okay. a father to no one. He's not a father. Now they'll say, well, the Quran is denying biological uh, filial relations, that Allah isn't a father in a biological sense. Baloney. Because if you go to chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran, the Jews and Christians are telling Muhammad, we are the sons of Allah and his beloved. And then Muhammad responds saying, say... Why then does he chastise you for your sin? Nay, you are but mortals he created. In other words, when the Jews and Christians are telling Muhammad we are the children of Allah, they don't mean biologically. Mm -hmm. They don't mean sexually. They don't mean through procreation. They mean spiritually. And Muhammad says no, because his God is a father to no one. Chapter 19, you know this. Mm -hmm. I'm preaching to the choir with you, but for the benefit of others. Chapter 19, verses 88 to 93, clearly tells you that even creation itself <clears throat> it, it stands in shock and terror that you would attribute a son to Allah because the highest relationship you can have with Muhammad's God is a slave to master relationship. So number one, if this passage proves anything, it proves that Muhammad is a false prophet and antichrist and that no Christian should ever consider the claims of Muhammad because the God that Jesus proclaimed is his father and the father of all true believers. That's the first point. No, no, but by the way, did, 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 everyone, did everyone catch that here, right? If Muslims want to go... To this passage, and most of the passages they go to to try and refute the deity of Christ are places where Jesus is speaking to the Father. But if we accept any of these as the words of Jesus, then Islam is refuted because according to both the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is our Father, our Heavenly Father. And therefore, any of these passages that they point to, you should stop and say, wait, so, so you're acknowledging here that according to the Bible, God is Father. But according to the Quran, Allah is a father to no one. And we're not just talking about in a biological sense. Allah is a father to you in no sense, right? Exactly, yeah. Slave to master relationship. Those are, that's the only relationship you can have with Allah. So any of these passages that Muslims are pointing to in an, in an effort to ultimately defend Islam, they've just done the reverse and shown that Muhammad was a false prophet because he's denying uh, the previous scriptures and the words of Jesus and the words yeah. of other prophets who refer to God as, as father. Yeah, all throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, you're going to find references to Yahovah being the father of his people in a spiritual sense. But So that's the first thing. So I want to thank the Muslim for convincing us to never trust or follow Muhammad. So I, I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, why would Jesus refer to the Father as his God? Well, because if you go back to the prologue, I'm not going to mention the entire prologue, but there we're told that the Word became flesh, John 1.14. The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, why is that relevant? Because David knows full well, and hopefully now everyone else will know, that according to Jeremiah 32, 27, th Jeremiah 32, 27. Jot down that reference, but, everyone. Yep, you got to. You got to write these down. You got to use them. We're not just here to entertain you. We want to educate you so know how to answer these objections for the glory of Jesus Christ. 
Jeremiah 32, 27, it says, I am Jehovah, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? So here, notice, notice, I am Jehovah, the God of all flesh. Now, since Jesus is distinct from the Father and the Spirit, though one God with them, and Jesus became flesh in order to fulfill the Father's will, because what did he say in John 6, 38? I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. So I've come down voluntarily to become flesh, to take a status of a servant, to fulfill my Father's will. If Jesus becomes flesh, and he's not the only person who is God, and the Father remains <clears throat> in heaven, <clears throat> in his glorious state, and God is spirit by nature, he didn't become flesh, but the Son became flesh, should it shock us and surprise us that from the moment that Jesus became flesh, the Father would become his God? Would that be shocking, David? We'd expect that, right? Mm -hmm. If the Son became flesh, not the Father, and the Father remains in his glorious state, and the Son became flesh in order to serve the Father, to become the, fa the Father's servant on earth, then from that moment on, we shouldn't be shocked to discover that the Father, who is also Jehovah, becomes the God of Christ in respect to his human nature. We would actually would have to expect that if the Bible's consistent. So the reason why Jesus has a God over him, namely the Father, is because Jesus became flesh, became a flesh and blood human being. Now someone might say, well, why does he still have a God in heaven? Because that's part of the argument. I don't want to introduce another argument, but oftentimes they'll go to Revelation 3.12 where our Lord Jesus Christ says four times he has a God. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and I'll give him a new name. Yeah, so four times there, he refers to the Father as his God. Now, why would Jesus still have a God in heaven? Well, David, if you if you can do me a favor, can you read mm -hmm. Revelation 22, 16? Yep. Just read that. And there's a third element to my response, and then we'll go on to other. I mean, we can spend hours unpacking this, but we're trying to give you something that's sufficient with the time we have, because there are other questions we like to entertain as well. But in Revelation 22, 16, so here's the question. Okay, on earth, the Father is his God. He's, he's flesh. Why would he still have a God in heaven? Why would the Father continue to be his God in heaven? Well, Revelation 22, 16 tells you. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Now, David, remember, I'm not a logician. You're a philosopher, logician, so you know logic. So help me understand this. If Jesus says in heaven, now, let's date the Revelation to around 90, 95, 80. That's the traditional dating. Some would say it's before 70. Be that as it may. Anywhere from 30 to 60 years after the ascension of Christ, he, he tells John, I am, not I was. I am right now. All these years after my resurrection and ascension, I am right now a descendant of David, an offspring of David. Now, help me understand. How could Jesus still be a descendant of David if he's no longer human? He doesn't have a physical body. He doesn't have human nature. Could you help me understand that? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Does that mean he's still a man, David? Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, then that means if he's still a man, the Father will continue to be his God. Now, will Jesus ever stop being a man? No. Part of the price of redemption in his infinite love for us he knew that by becoming flesh, he would have to keep that flesh, keep that additional human nature, f nature forever and ever. And he gladly paid that price for our redemption because of his love for us. And to prove that Jesus will remain a man, Acts 17, 30 to 31, it says that God overlooked such ignorance in the past, meaning the ignorance of the idolatry of the heathen, the Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. But now commands all men everywhere to repent, for he has assigned a day, that's what it says, he's assigned a day in which he will judge all men, by the man, he's appointed, and he's given proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So God the Father has set a day in which the man that he raised from the dead will judge them as a man. Now, David, again, I don't know too much logic. Mm -hmm. For Jesus to judge the world as a man, doesn't that mean he still is human and will be human when he returns? That would seem to be required by logic. Okay, so then Jehovah is the God of all flesh. The eternal word, distinct from the Father, becomes flesh. So his father, who's Jehovah, becomes his God. Where's the problem? Uh, yeah, I think I think the problem is that when Muslims come to this, they basically ignore the fact that we're Trinitarians and ignore the Incarnation and ignore basically everything that has to do with these doctrines. They approach our text as if we're Unitarians saying that Jesus is God and therefore, oh, it's it's very confusing that Jesus 
treats the father as God instead of being an atheist now that he's uh, taken on human yeah. flesh. Yeah. And the third final point, notice he quoted John twenty seventeen, right? Now remember, if the, John 20 is good enough to prove their point, then John 20 is good enough to refute them. What do we discover near the end of the chapter? In John 20, 27 to 29, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jesus appears to Thomas in his glorified flesh body. And what does Thomas say? It says, and Thomas answered and said to him, can't get around it, to him, I put out to, to him, my Lord and my God. Now the Greek is even more powerful. It says, hakuriasmu, the Lord of me, the Lord of me, kai hatheasmu, the God of me. So just like the Father is the God of all believers, Jesus being one with the Father in essence is also the God of all believers because there Thomas says, you Jesus are not just my Lord, you're also my God. And then Jesus says, shame on you, astaghfirullah, repent, do tawbah. Or he says, Thomas, have you seen me and believe? Blessed are those who do not see and believe. Believe what? That I'm the risen Lord who's the God of all flesh, the God of all believers. And you know what's interesting? Thomas's words echo what David said about Jehovah. In Psalm 35, 23, David says to Jehovah, you are my God and my Lord. Notice it's virtually the same thing. Mm -hmm. Thomas says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. David says to Jehovah, my God and my Lord. And if you look at the Greek translation, it's hakuriasmu. I'm sorry, hatheasmu. Psalm 35, hatheasmu kai hakuriasmu. What do we have Thomas saying? Hakuriasmu kai hatheasmu. Basically mm -hmm. the same phrase. David says, Jehovah, you're my God and my Lord. Thomas says to Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. You can't have more than one Lord God, and yet Jesus and the Father together are the Lord God of all believers. Mm -hmm. Sure sounds like John is on his way to the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so to uh, to the Muslims who would, who would use this verse from the Gospel of John, even from a, a chapter where one of Jesus' apostles identifies him as Lord and God, these are the same Muslims who will shout context whenever you bring up a whenever you bring up a Quran verse, right? Yeah. Right, and and it, they don't they don't seem to get. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a book that begins in its opening verses by identifying Jesus as the Eternal Word who was with the Father and who is God, and then goes on to say that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is a book that begins with an affirmation of the deity of Christ and the incarnation, uh, repeatedly throughout the book, identifies Jesus as the divine son, uh, ends here with, with an affirmation again of the deity of Christ by one, one of his apostles who finally gets it. And what you're telling us is, oh, this verse right here, this is showing that this book of John is is trying to show that Jesus is just a just a prophet. Are are, are you guys even serious when you do this? <laughs> yeah. oh, but David, hold on. The logos Christology is only found in John. You don't find it in Matthew, Mark. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> now, now I know you like to to blast that to smithereens, but just get they're the ones who are appealing to John, right? These are the, right. they're the ones appealing to John. Yeah. But even more ironic because uh, Shabir Ali had mentioned it in your debate and where, where you schooled him. Isn't it ironic that the Quran actually confirms the Logos Christology of John? If John is a later development and it's not found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what in the world is Muhammad doing aping John's Logos Christology in chapter 4, verse 171 of the Quran? So if John's Logos Christology is not historical because you can't trace it to Jesus, you just destroyed the Quran because the Quran confirms that Jesus is the word of Allah. In fact, 4171, that's a nightmare because that may segue into another question. Mm -hmm. The fact that the Quran goes out of its way to affirm that its passages are clear and provides a detailed explanation of all of its verses. And yet when the Christians started quoting 4171 against Muhammad, Muhammad all of a sudden came up with chapter 3 verse 7 saying, oh, some passages are ambiguous, don't focus on that. Mm -hmm. Whereas up to that point, he kept saying, this book, provides a detailed explanation for all its verses. It's clear. It's perspicuous. But when 4171 was used against him, oh, those are unclear passages. Only Allah knows their meaning. And what am I referring to? One of my favorite passages in the Quran that affirms that the Quran is a confused, incoherent book, <clears throat> unintelligible, and just babble. There it says, and it's supposedly refuting Christians who say Allah is the third of three. Mm -hmm. It says that Jesus, the Messiah, the son of Mary is an apostle of Allah. It doesn't say no more than an apostle. That's not what the Arabic says. 
is an apostle of Allah, <clears throat> messenger of Allah, Rasulullah, and his word, Al-Qaha illa Maryam. Al-Qaha means sent down to Mary. And his word sent down to Mary and a spirit from him. Now, notice how astonishing this passage is. It says that Jesus came down as Allah's word to Mary, and when he did so, he was a spirit that proceeded from him. Which makes sense because prior to entering Mary's blessed womb, Jesus would have existed as spirit. So how did he come down from Allah? As spirit. Took flesh from Mary and then went back up in flesh. So he's the word that came down to Mary, which means he pre-existed. For him to come down means he was up there somewhere with who? With Allah. And prior to being conceived by Mary, he came down as a spirit. Sure sounds like I'm reading a Christian writer who's simply confirming what John stated in the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. So what is Logos Christology doing in the Quran? Very interesting, very interesting stuff. But you know, I've heard from Muslims that when Jesus is called Allah's word, this simply means that Allah spoke, said be, and Jesus came into existence. Did you know that? Well, hey, that according to that logic, you are the word of Allah and I need to praise you. Wait a minute. So you're saying that this would make me the word of Allah because that's exactly how Allah created me too? All of us. That means you have to honor me and I have to honor you. In fact, the very Mac that you're looking at, that Mac Daddy, that's the word of Allah. So start bowing to it, baby. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's not go too far. Let's just agree that I am declared to be the word of Allah well, by Muslim apologists who try to explain this way. Now, everyone, keep, keep this in mind, right? When Jesus is called Allah's word, Sam, which, which other uh, uh, prophets in the Quran are called Allah's word? No one. No one. So just Jesus, right? Yep. And so it's, it's, it, if Allah is really trying to avoid confusing people, and he's just trying to spread pure Islamic monotheism. Wouldn't Allah be aware of the fact that Christians are using Jesus as the word of God to show yes. his deity? Wouldn't so instead of affirming that, wouldn't he want to wouldn't he want to say, Hey guys, just to be clear here, he's not the word. He's not no. the word. You, you, we, we know you think he's the eternal word. He's not. I mean it seems yeah. like that, but he calls him the word. I don't understand Allah making that mistake, knowing that Christians are just going to use that against him. I would understand the Quran coming from Muhammad, and Muhammad hears that Christians are saying this and doesn't understand what it means, and he just says it because he wants to show that he's on the same page with them on certain issues, yeah. friendly towards them on certain issues, that he's, yeah. on, that he's in line with the teachings of Jesus, but has no clue what it means. And it's not until he gets, uh, they use it to flip back on him and refute his teachings that then, oh, I'm sorry, the Quran is actually not as clear as uh, I've claimed all along. Yeah. And that, you have to hammer that point because once a Muslim tells you what it means for Jesus to be the word of Allah, they're going against chapter 3, verse 7. Just mm -hmm. make sure that they're getting what you're saying. Mm -hmm. People don't under, don't, may not know that according to the Muslim commentators, the first 80 verses of chapter 3, were composed in response to the debate that Muhammad had with the Christians from Najran, Arabic Christians. Get any commentator, Ibn Kathir, Tabari, this is not my opinion. They all agree. The first 80 verses were composed in response to the objections they raised. Now, why is that interesting? Because I'll have David read it in a minute. Chapter 3, verse 7, when the Christians, and this is in Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir says that Christians were telling Muhammad, hey, Muhammad, how can he deny Jesus is God? You call him the word of Allah and the spirit from him. In fact, the two honorific titles given to Jesus alone in Islam is Kalimat Allah, the word of Allah, Ruh Allah. These are titles given to him and no other prophet. And basically they argue that this means he must be eternal because he originates from Allah's very own being. Muhammad's response is there are two sets of passages in the Quran. One set of passage, uh, passages are clear. The foundation of the book focus on them. The other set are ambiguous, unclear, only Allah knows their meanings. And only those who are diseased at heart will focus on them. Now, here's the problem. If only Allah knows their meaning, then how can anyone, like Muhammad Hijab, tell you what it means for Jesus to be the word of Allah, when only Allah knows what it means, and Muhammad never gave the explanation for that title in reference to Jesus? Can you explain that to me, David? No, they just they, they know something Allah says they don't know. So that, that would make Allah wrong. 
Uh, and it's even funnier. Mm -hmm. According to Ibn Kathir, that verse itself is ambiguous because mm -hmm. there's two ways to read the verse. Because it says, and only Allah knows their meaning, full stop, and those of knowledge bear witness they believe in all of it. Now, the alternate way of reading it is, only Allah and those who possess knowledge know their meaning, full stop, and they affirm all of it. So is the passage saying only Allah knows or Allah and those of knowledge know the meaning? Even Muslims can't decide one way or another regarding the precise dotting and explanation of even this passage. Go figure. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh. I hope that uh, answered your question, and uh, if the Muslim who asked that question uh, is here, please tell us what you uh, think of that. I, I get the feeling, though, that he's going to want to change the topic. I, I, don't know, I don't know why I would think that. Um, here we have in the super chat, David, please come and visit us in Australia. God bless you and Halal Hogan. That's right. Shrimp, and, shrimp on the Barbie, huh? One of those? Yeah. yeah, I've always wanted to go to Australia and cuddle a koala bear. You guys gonna let me go out into the into the outback and yeah. cuddle a koala bear? Outback steakhouse, yay! Oh, by the way, I just want to give a shout. out. I think he's here, uh, Nak Demon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen, I've seen his comments popping up. Yeah, he's a Jewish follower of Jesus. Knows the Hebrew, knows the Targumim, knows the Jewish sources, and he's a top-notch apologist. So, Nak Demon, good to see you, brother. God bless you. Watch over and use you mightily for the glory of Yeshua Jesus. So just want to acknowledge him. He's another apologist we need to be praying for. Mm -hmm. That's about it. All right. Well, let's go on to some more questions here. Um, all right. This one comes from Ultimate Truth here. Sam, can you tell me why the first name Jesus of Barabbas is removed from Matthew twenty-seven seventeen in the King James Version while it is in the Revised Standard Version. I don't know what you mean removed the King James Version because the King James Version is based on a set of manuscripts that are later. So if you're asking me why do those set of manuscripts remove the word Jesus Barabbas, number one, that assumes that Jesus, the word Jesus, is original to what Matthew wrote and not maybe interpolation. But I, again, either way, if it's original or not, if it was removed, it would make sense because a scribe may have assumed. Again, I don't know for sure because I'm not there. I don't have access to the scribe's mind. I can't sit down and have tea and ask him. Mm -hmm. So this is pure conjecture. But let's assume, and by the way, what he's talking about, uh, David, is that if you find, like if you pick up the NIV, which is based on some of the earlier Greek witnesses, it says that Barabbas' name, full name, was Jesus Barabbas. Now, why is that interesting? Because if you take it from the Aramaic or Hebrew, his name was Yeshua Bar Abba, meaning Jesus, son of the Father. So notice why, why that's amazing. You have two Jesuses standing before Pilate. Both of them are Bar Abba, because remember in Jesus' prayer, mm -hmm. he refers to God as Abba, right? So that's Aramaic for Father. So you have Jesus, the Messiah, son of the Father, Bar Abba, and then you have Jesus, this insurrectionist, this criminal, also known as Bar Abba. Right, Barab Barabbas is simply the Greek way of saying Baraba. Two Jesuses, both called the Son of the Father. Now, why would if Jesus was there in the original manuscripts, why would it be removed? Very simply, in order to avoid confusion, because if you have Jesus Barabbas being released, someone may argue that the Jesus the Messiah was released, so that someone else died in place. And you know what's interesting? You even have Muslims using that argument, saying there was a confusion regarding which of the Jesuses was taken to the cross, right? So again, if it was original, it was removed, perhaps because the scribes didn't want someone else to get confused regarding which Jesus actually went to the cross and which Jesus was set free. Now, with that said, let me just elaborate on something why this is amazing, David, why everything in Scripture, you see God's sovereign hand guiding all the events to point to Jesus Christ as the ultimate fulfillment. Do you remember on the Day of Atonement, and Nak Dimon is more than qualified to talk about this. This is his forte and specialty. In Leviticus 16, there were two goats, right? You had two goats, right? And then you had one goat in which would be sacrificed for the sins of the people. And then you'd have the other goat in which I priest would put his hand upon him and pronounce the sins of all the nation and let him go in the wilderness. Let him go, carrying the sins of the people away. Two goats, right? How does that tie in with Jesus and Barabbas? Well, you have two Jesuses, both are called Baraba. 
One is sinless. He's crucified. The other one, full of sin, is released. Do you think that's a coincidence? Or do you see a picture of what was to come, perfectly fulfilled, and the two Barabbases, the two Jesuses? Mm -hmm. The scapegoat and the sacrificial goat. Mm -hmm. So, hope that answered the question. I don't know if it satisfied him, but yeah, that assumes that Jesus was part of what Matthew wrote and some of the scribes would have omitted it. If that's the case, based on conjecture, because I don't know the scribes, I can't ask them, they're dead, right? So, mm -hmm. I can't psychoanalyze them why they didn't. Mm -hmm. But if they did, then it may have been because they wanted to avoid confusion regarding the identity of which Jesus was released and which Jesus was nailed to the cross. Mm -hmm. All right, hope that helps. Uh, we have Tony T here. Tony T here says, what do you think of Christian Prince and how he deals with Muslims? Um, I've only seen a probably no, two the Christian man. Prince videos over, over time. But Sam, I know you know him. So, no, uh, he's, so he's, what would your response be? He is a lion that they're afraid to even get near because he knows Arabic and he doesn't pull punches. So you don't mess with Christian Prince, baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, he's the man. So God bless him and preserve him for the glory of Christ. And so yeah. I don't know what the intent here was to suggest, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if Tony T is asking, uh, you know, is he too aggressive or is he just right? But the, the general principle would be there, there, there are different kinds of Muslims out there. And so it's good that there are different kinds of approaches, right? And yeah, yeah. there are Muslim, there are, there are Muslims out there who, um, who might be very nice and loving. And so with them, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to be crushing them with an aggressive approach. There, there are lots of other Muslims out there who will only listen to you if you're coming at them with a pretty, pretty aggressive approach. So, uh, I think that it's very good that we have, um, Christians who will, uh, you know, just invite Muslims over and invite them to church and talk to them and befriend them and be, you know, get to know them over time and stuff like that. And, uh, at the same time, you, you really need Christians who, um, are just, just, coming right at them over and over again. Lots of Muslims deep down respect that approach more. And so they're going to, they're going to pay attention to that more. Yeah. And a couple of Muslims just recently left on the show. They've called in and left Islam because that approach can be used of the Holy Spirit, right? So praise God for what he's doing. Praise God for what David's doing. Praise God for Anthony and all the soldiers and warriors in Christ. As long as we honor Christ and we don't go to the far extreme, right? Where our, our manner is totally against scripture and so praise god for all these people we need mm -hmm. more soldiers not less all right sam uh osvaldo says i think muhammad was the creator of islam but i don't think he is a prophet can you find a prophecy in the quran that muhammad said and it came to pass now i can think of i can think of one off the top of my head that Muslims would yeah, use yeah. for that, right? The, 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 the battle victory and the, you know, the fight between the Romans and the, the Persians. But what, what would you say? Yeah, that's the, that's the only passage that is supposed to be prophetic. But here's the problem. And by the way, so they know what you're referring to is chapter 30 verses one of four of the Quran. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem with that passage. Uh, if you want to read it, David, maybe we can show them why there's a problem with it. And there are actually modern, translations of the Quran done by Quran only Muslims. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of at least two translations done by Qurani, meaning Quran only Muslims, that actually render the Arabic differently because remember, the Arabic Quran is a consonantal text, right? Mm -hmm. So the way you dot the text, the ty type of vowel markings you add to it can change the meaning. And I'll mention that right after he reads the passage. Now folks, don't forget, let me put this in context. The Quran in many passages, I'll just give you three off the top of my head. Note these down. We're not going to look at them. 41 verse 3 of the Quran. Note that down. I'm going to work backwards. 41 verse 3, 1689. Note that down, 1689. And 6114 of the Quran. 6114. All, all of them say, and there's plenty. I'm just giving you three of many. That the Quran is in clear Arabic so people can understand it. A book that provides detailed explanation of its passages. It fully explains its verses, right? Now, remember that assertion in light of what he's about to read in chapter 30, verses 1 to 4. What does it say? It said 31 to 4? Let's see. Yes, chapter 30, verses 1 to 4. Yeah. See what it says there. Uh, we have the letters here, Aleph, Lim, uh, Aleph Lam Mim. The Romans have been defeated in the nearer land, and they, after their defeat, will be victorious. Within 10 years, This that's Pictol, um, or within a few years, uh, Hillel Khan within three to nine years or Shakir within a few years. Yeah. 
So now, what does it say? The Romans uh, have Allah, indif- Allah is the command in the former case and in the latter, and in that day, believers will rejoice. Okay, so notice. The Romans have been defeated in a land nearby, in a nearer land, and in a few years, three to nine, that's what Muslim scholars say, three to nine, they shall be victorious. Now, here's my question for the Muslims if they're listening, and I want Christians to pay attention. Number one, who defeated them? We're not told. Where were they defeated? It says a land nearby. Nearby what? Nearby Mecca, nearby by Medina, nearby Turkey, nearby Petra, nearby Jerusalem. Nearby what? And in a few years from the defeat, they shall be victorious. A few years from what date so that we can at least know whether the prophecy took place within the specified period of time. And isn't it interesting, David, that omniscient Allah can only guess a few years. He can't even give you the pre- precise amount of years it would take the Romans to to defeat whoever defeated them. Now, that's, that's assuming the quote-unquote traditional rendering of the continental text. In other words, here you read, it says, the Romans have been defeated, and in a few years they'll be victorious. Now, there's a Quran that people can get online for free as a PDF file. It's called the Quran, the Reformist Translation. Reformist Translation. Headed by Edip Yuxel. He's he's, uh, notorious for being a Quran-only Muslim. If you go and read their translation, it doesn't say the Romans have been defeated. In their translation, David, it says... The Romans have vanquished their enemies, and in a few years, they shall be defeated. Mm -hmm. Now, what does the Arabic continental text actually say? Does it say the Romans have been defeated, they'll be victorious? Or does it say the Romans are victorious, and they will be defeated in a few years, which these Muslims take to mean the Muslims would defeat the Romans. After their victory, the Muslims would defeat the Romans. However you want to adopt the continental text, the point remains. The very fact you have two different ways of reading the text, the very fact the text doesn't tell you who defeated them or who they defeated, and what land did this take place and when, shows you this is a massively unimpressive prophecy. How in the world does this vindicate Muhammad's prophethood? Yeah, um, it, it's uh, it, it's really interesting that they have an entire book, and you know that that was the sort of core feature of a prophet is he's going to. Prophecy, right? He's going, he's going to prophesy. Um, and Muslims, just like after 14 centuries of trying to find where the Bible refers to Muhammad, they've come up with a handful of really, really strained passages in order to try and justify this. Um, Sam just went through their best example of a yes. prophecy by yeah. Muhammad. And, you know, the, the, the reason this is terribly interesting is... Um, no, so, so suppose he, he, he just nailed this, right? Hey, you know, this group has just been defeated, but the other group's going to be defeated too. They're, they're at a war. They're going, <laughs> they're going back and forth, right? I could, I could say that right now, right? You, you, you show me two warring countries who've been warring for a while and one of them wins a battle. I can say, up, oh, someone else is going to win a battle. And, <laughs> If the Muslims expect us to take this as vindication of Muhammad's prophethood, my goodness, I can think of, I can, I mean, anyone, anyone who tells you, hey, I predicted that the Pittsburgh Steelers would defeat the New England Patriots <laughs> today. I, I said it, and boy, they did. Boy, they did. Pittsburgh just won. I'm a prophet now. I said it. I told everyone Pittsburgh's going to win this one. I'm a prophet. Now, Muslims would never in a million years take this as any sort of significant argument at all. But with Muhammad, they just have so little to go on. There's so little actual content there to try and show that he's a prophet that they'll grasp at pretty much anything, even if it's the worst argument anyone's ever heard ever. But they'll take it as decisive proof that Muhammad's a prophet. And why? Well, that's just what you're stuck with, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, the real miracle of the Quran is that people think it's miraculous. That's mm-hmm. a miracle for me. That's miracle. By the way, as, since we're on here, if there's no other question, there's another passage that is a nightmare for the Muslims. And if you if you have your translation open, because I don't have the Quran with me, it's 17 verse 1. Let's mm-hmm. let's have some fun. Because remember, the Quran claims to be a clear <clears throat> Arabic Quran for mm-hmm. people to understand and that it is a book that provides detailed exposition for its passages. It mm-hmm. fully expounds its passages until Muhammad got stumped, and then he started talking about ambiguous passages, which came later. But 
<clears throat> 17 verse 1. I want everyone to pay attention. Mm -hmm. We're giving you their best. 17 verse 1. Notice there what it says in 17 verse 1. Glory be to him who made his servant to go on a night from the sacred mosque to the remote mosque of which we have blessed the precincts so that we may show to him some of our signs. Surely he is the hearing, the seeing. Wow. Now, David, here's my, my problem with this passage. Who is the servant that was taken from the sacred mosque? Where in the world is the sacred mosque to the farthest mosque? Where in the world is the farthest mosque? Because if you go back and look at the Arabic, the word farthest mosque is Masjid al-Aqsa. Now, you and I know historically there was no Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem because that's what Muslims will tell you. It's referring to Muhammad being taken from the Kaaba in Mecca to Jerusalem. There was no temple and there was no mosque, especially a mosque called Masjid al-Aqsa. Masjid al-Aqsa was erected by the caliph uh, Marwan in around 691 AD. So what in the world is this passage talking about? Who is the servant? We're not told. Taken from the sacred mosque. What sacred mosque where? We're not told. To the farthest mosque, Masjid al-Aqsa. Well, historically, the only mosque called Masjid al-Aqsa came around 691 AD, which is supposedly 60 years after the reported death of Muhammad. So how could this servant be taken to a non-existent mosque? But then it gets even juicier because here you either have david uh, muhammad being deified or allah being subjected to others what do i mean i want you to read the part says so that we may show him the precincts i want you to read that part slowly till the end watch mm -hmm. this david look, look 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 at how beautiful the quran is man it's a masterpiece watch here see what it says <clears throat> glory be to him who made his servant to go on a night from the sacred mosque to the remote mosque of which we have blessed the precincts. Okay, stay close right there. We have blessed its precincts. We, and what else they're going to do? So they're that we show, may, so that we may show to him some of our signs. Go ahead. Surely he is the hearing. What the is there? Okay, now, David, you confused the heck out of me. I think you're from that smirk, you caught it. The we says, we're going to show him our signs. Yeah. He is the hearing, the seeing. Wait, wait, wait. If the him is Muhammad, we are going to show Muhammad our signs. They just said Muhammad is omniscient, right? And <clears throat> omnipresent. But that can't be Muhammad. Well, if it's Allah, what in the world is Allah doing being shown miracles by some group this group called we. Who are the we who's showing Allah miraculous signs? And why does he need to be shown signs? Mm -hmm. So who's talking here about whom? David, mm -hmm. help me out. Yeah, that's uh, uh, it, it, remind, it reminded me of the famous passage from Ali Dashti. Remember that where he, he starts talking about the the, 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 the the problems with the pronouns in the Quran, right? Yeah, right there. Yeah, if, yeah if, if, right if, there. If, if, we if, will show him all the signs. Yeah. Uh, let me go and read that passage, by the way. Ali Dashti in his book 20... Yeah, read 20, it so it, and highlight it for them. David, highlight yeah. it for them. Yeah. Ali Dashti in his book 23 Years writes, The Quran contains sentences which are incomplete and not fully intelligible without the aid of commentaries. Foreign words, unfamiliar Arabic words, and words used with other than the normal meaning. Adjectives and verbs inflected without observance of the concords of gender and number. Illogically and ungrammatically applied pronouns, which sometimes have no referent, and predicates which in rhymed passages are often remote from the subjects. These and other such aberrations in the language have given scope to critics who deny the Quran's eloquence. Now, just, just check, check this out, everyone. All right. Allah says, we have blessed the precincts so that we may show to him some of our signs. So Allah is speaking first person plural about some guy, right? Whether you want to say that's Muhammad or someone else. Allah, we are going to bless him. And then Allah says, surely he is the hearing, the seeing. Who's the All he, right? right? So suppose, suppose you didn't, you didn't see anything about the hearing and the seeing right there. You just said Allah, Allah is speaking and Allah says, we are going to bless him. He is, who would you think he's talking about there? Who would you think that he is, is referring to? This is 
This is the guy he's talking about, right? And Muslims yeah. want to tell us this is Muhammad, right? So, so Muhammad is the hearing and the seeing. What do you think? Wow. So he's omniscient? He's a god? He's oh, a god? No. Oh, my no. goodness. No, because that would mean that Muslims constantly deify Muhammad and not realize it. What? Muslims would end up deifying Muhammad? That is blasphemy, dude. Come on. It's pure monotheism. Tawheed. All right. Akbar. So do we not have any prophecies right. from Muhammad? No? No. That's All right. about it. Sure, they'll go to the Hadith, but yeah. that century is removed, and that's after the fact. So yeah, yeah, nothing impressive. After. All right. Yep. Here we have absurd scandal. What do you make of Abu Bakr ordering his Muslim generals to not kill children, women, or the elderly, and to not steal booty when the first Islamic expansions started? Is this prohibition real? Yeah. You can comment on that, David. That's your expertise. <clears throat> well, yeah. uh, well, just uh, off, off, the, off the top of my head here. Um, yeah. If you're talking, if you're talking about the not killing children and women, uh, Sam, weren't women and children the the property of Muslims when they right. would conquer an area? That's right. Why would you kill your booty, your property, your possession? Mm -hmm. Because women could be enslaved and raped even if they're married, and the children becomes pretty much your young boys to do what you want anytime you want them to do it. So yeah, that's your property. Why would mm -hmm. you want to destroy your property? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and so it makes sense that prohibited. Yeah, well, yeah, and in, in, in the Hadith, Muhammad wasn't terribly concerned if uh, if you you ended up killing a a kid in battle in the heat of battle, especially during a night raid or something like that. Just uh, um, he said when his followers came to him and said, "Oh, we, you know, we 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 killed a kid in the night raid." He said, "They are from them, right? Meaning they're from the the pagans." So it, it's not a don't be too broken hearted over it. But uh, as far as as far as not killing certain people. Um, I mean, th think about this. If you if you read about the Muslim raids, and by the way, you, you you want to get Robert Spencer's book, The History of Jihad, which talks about oh, you know over the centuries as the jihad expanded, um, century by century, never never relenting, um, talking about all the the women and children being taken captive by these armies. Could you imagine how enraged? How enraged Muslims would be. You run in there and you start hacking up the women and the children. They're sex captives and they're slaves. That's, yeah. the, that's, that's one of the, that's the main thing they were fighting for. Right? <laughs> that's what, that's what they yeah. were fighting for. They're fighting for their war booty. Are you going to hack up their war booty? Okay. Precisely. Now, what's interesting about that, David, is that the Hadith, the later sources are improving upon the Quran. Remember what I said? I'm going to sound like a broken hammer, uh, hammer, broken record, hammer, thinking <laughs> Thor. No, but <laughs> you broke, definitely yeah, sound broke, like a broken, broken hammer. Broken you're right, it's like when Thor's right, hammer right. got broke. But look at this, this anvil, baby. You can hit the, a hammer on this anvil, never crack. But anyway, coming back to the issue, remember I kept saying that the Quran goes out of its way to say that it is a scripture that is clear Arabic, so people can understand, and provides a fully detailed exposition, explanation of its verses. Here's what's ironic, and I challenge the Muslims to show me that. Quote any passage of the Quran that speaks of jihad, where it says, when you are doing jihad in the way of Allah, fi sabil Allah, you are not to kill women and children. Mm -hmm. Find me that prohibition in the Quran. That's not in the Quran. The Quran just gives blanket statements, general statements to kill the kufar, mm -hmm. but it doesn't say only combatants do not harm the women or the children. In other words, the later sources are improving upon the language of the Quran, showing the Quran is not as clear as Muslims would like it to be. Now, that may work for Sunni Muslims, but Sunni Muslims are still placed in the same dilemma. They'll say, see, that's why you need the son of Muhammad, because mm -hmm. he explains the Quran. No, the Quran says that the Quran will provide <clears throat> a full exposition for its verses, so you don't need an external source telling you what the Quran says. Mm -hmm. But the fact that I need Muhammad and these other sources shows the Quran is wrong. So either way, you have problems with the Quran. Yeah, um, and, and notice the commands that you actually have in the Quran Fight those who do not believe in Allah, right? Yeah, general. Fight those who do not believe in Allah nor the last day. Um, if 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 you're taking these passages, fight the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. Um, if you're taking these passages, and Allah's word is perfect, well, guess what? My 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 children don't believe in the don't believe in Allah the way Islam commands Muslims to believe in Allah. 
In other words, if you want to say they believe in God, yeah, they believe in God. But as far as what Islam teaches um, and the things that have been forbidden by Islam, they don't believe those things. So exactly. without help, without help from external sources, you can't even get these. You can't even get the idea that that they shouldn't be killing women and children. Right. So yeah, the Quran, no... the, the Quran, to give it to give it the interpretation that Muslim apologists are giving it, they, they can't just go to the Quran or it would be fight anyone who doesn't believe in Allah. And that would include yeah. the elderly yeah. and that would include. Yeah. 100%. In fact, the Quran itself provides examples in which everything was destroyed, everyone was destroyed, women, children, cattle. It talks about the flood of Noah, it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, then you have the story of Al-Khidr, right? The Muhammad, uh, Moses' companion, where in chapter 18, verses 74 and 80, what appeared to be an innocent young man was killed. Mm -hmm. And Mo Moses, I keep saying Muhammad, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I don't mean to insult the prophet Moses, but Moses was irate and livid that he would kill an innocent boy. And he mm -hmm. says, you killed an innocent boy. Now, the justification given by Moses's companion, don't take my word for it. I want people to read 1874 all the way to 81. Just read that section. It's 1874 to 81, but specifically 74 and 80. The man said that we feared that we'd he, he'd grow up to be a rebel. Notice, we feared he'd grow up to be a rebel, a tyrant, an unbeliever. In other words, that was a fear he had, but he wasn't certain whether that youth, that innocent boy, would grow up to be a rebel, a tyrant, an unbeliever. So on the suspicion that he may end up becoming this rebel tyrant, an unbeliever, he killed him with Allah's permission. So if I follow the Quran as an example, there you have a passage that would give a license to even kill children if you suspect that children will be corrupted and turn out to be rebels, renegades. Mm-hmm. Without any prohibition. I mean, so if you follow the Quran, you have problems. But if you follow the Sunnah to explain the Quran, you have problems because the Quran says you don't need anything but the Quran when you, in reality, you do. Mm -hmm. So damn if you do, damn if you don't. Yep. Uh, Damien says that he can answer the issue about Jesus being the word of Allah in Islam. He says, I have read some hadiths, and to my understanding, Jesus was born with the word of God in Islam. Jesus preached the word of God since childhood now sam do you think that answers the issue here that that um jesus yeah. being born having the word of allah is why jesus would be called the word of allah yeah, yeah. now first of all i i'm a little confused damien if he's not a muslim why is he trying to defend islam because i'm assuming he's not a muslim he's a non-muslim but let's put that aside Let's put that aside. Why a non-Muslim wants to help Muslims? Well, he's probably going to say, because I want to be honest and consistent. Well, number one, <clears throat> I would really like to see the hadith that he claims he read that says that's why Jesus is called the word of Allah, because he was born with the word of Allah and he preached the word of Allah. I'd like to see that, because if we use that logic, that means any and every prophet who preached the word of Allah, ipso facto, would make him or her the word of Allah. That doesn't make sense. Number two, I guess what I said fell on deaf, deaf ears. According to the Muslim expositors, according to the Muslim commentators, chapter 3, verse 7, was composed in order to discourage Christians from using verses from the Quran, calling Jesus the word of Allah, because those passages are ambiguous, unclear. And the passage says, no one knows their meaning except Allah. So if you found a hadith telling you what it means for Jesus to be the word of Allah, you just proved chapter 3 verse 7 is wrong. Because according to that passage, no one knows what it means for Jesus to be the word of Allah or spirit from Allah except Allah. And he hasn't given that information in the Quran or even to Muhammad because Muhammad didn't explain what it means for Jesus to be the word of Allah. Because as David said earlier, Muhammad was simply aping what he heard from the Christians. He was taking certain Christian <clears throat> beliefs, concepts, terminology, adopting it as part of his religion with the hopes to entice Christians to take him seriously and consider him as a prophet, not realizing that the things he was taking and adapting as part of his religion end up exposing him as a false prophet. So I'd really like to see that narration that says he's the word of, God, the word of Allah because he preached the word of Allah. That means that Adam must be the word of Allah because he preached the word of Allah. Moses, Abraham, Isaac, you go down the list. But I will tell you what Muslims say it means. And we alluded to it earlier. 
Jesus is the word of Allah because he was created by Allah's command, kun. Kun fayakun, and he was, or he is. Kun fayakun means he, you know, be, and he is. Problem with that is, if that's what it means, that means, as David said, since the Quran says, everything and everyone is created by the word of Allah, everything and everyone would be the word of Allah, that would make Adam the word of Allah, yet no one in the Quran, even Hadith literature, besides Jesus, is called the word of Allah. So that will not suffice as a counter <clears throat> response. Sorry. All right. I didn't think it would serve as a counter response either. Um, because if all these guys are, um, as you pointed out, if, if, if all these guys are preaching the word of Allah, but aren't called the word of Allah, the, the response there seemed to be, well, Jesus was doing it at a younger age. Okay. Yeah. What, what in the world? I have what no idea how, the, how that connection would be made. So, the, the, and by the way, the that, point here, the point here is, I mean, you've got Muslim apologists, and again, the, the, the common response from Muslim apologists today, the common response of Muslim apologists today is, oh, this just means that Allah said, be, and Jesus was. Now, that just mm -hmm. opens up all kinds of other problems, as we've already pointed out. This would make us the word of Allah, and we can start, Sam and I can start calling ourselves the word of Allah, according to this interpretation. But think about this. The point is, no one knows what this means, right? We as Christians have a, <laughs> we have a really, really, really good idea of what it means and of where this, where this uh, originated and of why Muhammad was using it, but Muslims have no clue what it means. Right, and you ask them, and they they can give you all kinds of different answers, but they have no actual answer because they're just confused. In in a book that is supposedly um, up until this issue arose, was supposedly clear and fully explained, explained in detail. These are the things the Quran says about itself, and yet we get down to these issues whether we're talking about fighting, whether we're talking about theology, and Muslims have no clue what these passages mean and keep having to go to outside sources to tr even try to understand what these things mean. Yeah. And, and so the Quran isn't the clear book that, that it claims to be. It isn't fully explained. It isn't explained in detail. Yeah. In fact, David, to add to the confusion, mm -hmm. you said something interesting. No Muslim can tell us what it means for Jesus to be the word of Allah because that's one of those ambiguous passages. But as Christians, we have the answer. Mm -hmm. We have the answer because the New Testament tells us what it means for Jesus to be the Word of God. Now, if someone wants me to explain biblically why he's called the Word of God, you can ask in the comments because I want to add some more confusion. Because remember what David said, and I confirmed it, that Muhammad was hearing Christians saying certain things about Jesus that he adopted as part of his religion with the hopes that he could convince them, see, I agree with these things about Jesus, so why don't you consider my prophetic claims? Not realizing the things that he accepts from Christianity, actually end up exposing him as a false prophet and antichrist. Other problems in the Quran <clears throat> that Muslims don't have answers for. Number one, Jesus' mother is the only woman mentioned by name in the entire Quran. 114 chapters, over 6,000 verses. Women are not mentioned by name. That gives you an idea of what Muhammad thought about women. They're identified by their relationship. The wife of Ibrahim, the wife of Moses, the daughter of so-and-so, right? They're not mentioned by name. Mary is the only woman mentioned by name. She even has an entire chapter named in her honor. Chapter 19, Surah Al-Maryam. Chapter 19, it's named in her honor. Mary is also said to be the greatest woman that Allah created. That's chapter 3, verse 42. Again, I'm speaking fast because I want to cover a lot of ground. But this is all in our articles, our lectures, our, our debates. You'll find it on David's blog, YouTube page, my channel, etc. All right. In chapter 3, verse 42, Mary is said to be preferred by Allah above all women and purified. Now, if you go to the Muslim expositors, they'll tell you that Allah purified Mary in this way. He made sure that she was conceived without sin, without any impurities, without any lustful desires, and she remained in that state till Allah took her. The only woman said to be absolutely pure, sinless, from conception till the time of her departure from this earth. Now, her son is also sinless. We know that. Related to that, related to that, in chapter 3, verse 33, it says that Allah preferred the family of Imran from all creatures, not just human beings, all creatures. You know why that's astonishing, folks? It says he preferred Adam and then Abraham and then the family of Imran. According to the Quran, 
the family Imran is Mary and Jesus. Because in that chapter, we're told Imran happens to be the father of Mary, the, the maternal grandfather of Jesus. So here we're told Imran's family is preferred above all creatures. Why? Because Jesus and Mary are from Imran. Why her family? Why his line, not Muhammad's line? Why Jesus' mother is mentioned by name as the greatest woman? Why not Muhammad's mother? And related to that, again, I'm going to try to wrap it up real quick. Related to that, Sahih Muslim, regarding Muhammad's mother and father. The Muslim companions of Muhammad saw Muhammad weeping at his mother's grave. He was weeping. He went to a gravesite weeping. They asked him, why are you weeping? He said, because I was praying that Allah would forgive her. In other words, forgive her sins so that she wouldn't be tormented in hell. And Allah refused to forgive her. Implication, Muhammad's mother is burning in hell. What about his father? One of these <clears throat> jahil, 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 meaning pre-Islamic Arabs, came up to Muhammad and said, Muhammad, where's my father? Because my father died before Islam. He said to him, your father's in the fire. He walked away sad. So then Muhammad called him over and said, wait, wait, wait. Not only is your father in the fire, my father is with your father. They're both burning in hell. Wow. Muhammad's mother and father are burning in hell. Jesus' mother is absolutely pure, sinless, and perfect from conception till the time Allah took her. She's the only woman mentioned by name, the greatest of all women. And she alone conceived a son without sexual intercourse. Why? Why? There's no answers in the Quran. You see that chirping sound? Mm -hmm. Silence? Chirp, chirp. I need to have some sound effects where I can just toss in crickets chirping when you ask like that. Yeah, because there is no answer. Yeah. From the biblical perspective, we have the answers. What I'm saying is, here again, we have Muhammad aping certain biblical truths, not realizing it ends up destroying him and his credibility. Mm -hmm. So, yep. there you go. <clears throat> All right. Top student says, uh, David, when is the Muhammad versus Jesus rap coming? Um, that's going to require a few stages. One, it has to be written as a song and then recorded as a song. And then after that, be made into the music video. Sam, that was the worst dancing I've ever seen in my entire life. I know, man. Fortunately, hey, it's, not, hey. it's not as bad, quite as bad as you're singing. <laughs> um, hey, man, I can do a cameo as Elvis Presley, bro. Don't hate. Yeah, for, for, yeah. for anyone who's, uh, uh, who doesn't understand what this is referring to, we, uh, if anyone has ever seen any of the videos, the, the, the epic rap battles of history, it'll be like Hitler versus Darth Vader and stuff. And then they would say at the end, they would say at the end, uh, who's next? You decide, right? And there would be people saying Jesus versus Muhammad, but no one wants to do a Jesus versus Muhammad rap battle because you're going to get your head chopped off, right? You, you, in order to have Muhammad, in order to have Muhammad doing a uh, rap battle, you'd have to have Muhammad in there and rapping. And uh, if you're if you're going to make it amusing, he's going to have to be talking about some of the stuff he did. And so they would never do this, even though they're saying, "Hey, you decide." You're not really deciding. Um, so anyway, anyway, we got the bright idea. Well, yeah, we might get our heads chopped off, but we're, we're kind of okay with that. We know where we're going. So yeah, we might be willing to do that. Anyway, we've got, we've got all the, we've got all the rappers in place. We've got all the rappers we need. Um, we're going to have to fund the project eventually. So eventually, uh, eventually I'll put out a call for, for people to, um, you're going to have to get a studio. You're going to have to do all the, you know, get professionally video recorded and stuff like that uh, for the music video. But we're going to do it. We actually have uh, uh, the the best Christian disc rapper on the planet who's going to be uh, who's going to be writing the rhymes. And uh, I've mentioned before, it's basically going to be Jesus rapping about creating the universe and saving humanity and uh, Muhammad rapping about how white he is and how many people he slaughtered and how many women he's uh had so to be a good description of of their their lives and a good encapsulation of the comparison because really i mean really when you line up jesus and muhammad even if you just went with jesus and muhammad in the quran there's really no comparison right if you go with the the jesus of scripture compared with the muhammad of history there is a, there's no comparison there and so uh, we want people to know that because the people who think there is a good comparison are usually people who don't know anything about Jesus and don't know anything about Muhammad. Yeah. And like you said, the Quran itself, not that we believe the Quran is the word of Allah, meaning God. Yeah. It's not the word of God. And it's not historically accurate when it comes to the lives 
teachings of the prophets of the scriptures. With that said, the Quran itself, Jesus is superior to Muhammad. Muhammad pales in comparison as beneath the feet of Jesus, even according to the Quran. Even mm -hmm. according to the Quran. I mean, we can do, I've done sessions, I've written articles, we've done shows, we can do it in the future. Quranic Christology, the Christology of the Quran, and although the Jesus of the Quran is not the true Jesus of history, what the Quran says about Jesus makes Muhammad look like nothing in comparison. Yeah, but once you, go, once you go outside of the Quran, you find the Hadith that Satan touches every child to be born in the world, but he couldn't touch Jesus or Muhammad, right, Sam? No. Is that, that's, that's not what it said? No, no, no. And I'm glad you mentioned it because this is based on Muhammad's interpretation of chapter 3, verse 36, where Mary's mother prayed to Allah and trusted her and her son to the protection of Allah from Satan. So Muhammad said, Allah honored her prayer by making sure that Satan was not allowed to touch neither Mary nor her son among all the children of Adam, the only two. Notice again, it's not just Jesus, it's his blessed mother, Mary and her son. Meaning, Muhammad himself was touched, pricked by Satan at birth, which is why he cried. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's Muhammad's explanation of chapter 3, verse 36 of the Quran, by the way. And you know what, David, what's amazing about that? Two verses in the Quran, I want people to get this. I want them to use it for the glory of Christ, because even Paul would appeal to the writings of the Stoics, mm -hmm. the Epicureans, the pagans, to prove his point. Mm -hmm. So we have an example in Paul to use the sources of those that were witnessing to prove our claims. Now, here's what's astonishing. Chapter 16, verse 61, chapter 35, verse 45 of the Quran. It says, if Allah were to call into account mankind for their evil doing, mm -hmm. it says he would not leave a single creature on earth. Meaning, if Allah were to judge creatures for their sin, he'd wipe out everything. But wait, David, the Quran and the Hadith say Mary and Jesus are absolutely sinless, flawless, absolutely pure and perfect. From the time they were conceived until the time Allah took them. How could they be absolutely pure and free of sin when those passages in the Quran saying, there is no creature on earth that is sinless? So what does this suggest about Mary and Jesus, David? You're the logician. Help me understand. What does that imply? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That they're not of this earth. Wow. So you mean Muhammad turned Allah into the third of three? So you do have Allah and Jesus and Mary as three divinities? Because for them not to be of this earth and more than creatures, they must be divine. <laughs> Irony of ironies, it's mm -hmm. Muhammad who turned Allah into the third of three. Allah, Jesus, and his mother. Mm -hmm. Way to go, Muhammad. Good old Muhammad. <laughs> All right, I'm, 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 I normally wouldn't respond to this, but I've seen it posted multiple times over the past couple live chats. Dr. Wood, do you have anything against Christian Prince? Why? What, what did I just say? I, I've, I've watched like two Christian Prince videos in the past like 12 or 13 years. Yeah. How, why in the world would you think I am able to even contact? Like, 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 let me give you an example. I keep hearing about Bob the Builder. Um, yeah. I have no idea who that is. I've never watched a Bob the Builder video. Based on the amount of times I'm hearing about him, I assume he's doing some amazing work but if it's david you don't talk about bob the builder do you have a problem with him what are you talking about I, I, i've I never seen you speak s dot larock i've never seen you speak about william lane craig what's your problem with william lane craig you have a problem with william lane craig what are you talking about yeah, I, I, don't, yeah, I, don't, I don't i don't i don't watch sam's pal talk videos you know why because i prefer seeing someone talking to me there right i have a uh I have a, not sure how to put this. I have a slight phone phobia, right? I don't like talking on the phone, it, mainly if it's someone I don't know. And it's not that I feel any fear of it. I just uh, feel like I have trouble breathing. It's even worse with a drive-through speaker, right? If, 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 if you'll never see me at a drive-through window, um, I'll go, I'll go in and order something. And the reason is if there's not, an, if there's a, a voice and not an actual person, I just start, it's, it's, again, it's not, a, I don't feel scared or, or anything. I just, like, I start losing my breath. And if you hear me, if you ever hear me in, in an interview, if, I, if I'm being interviewed for a radio interview, and it's someone that has never interviewed me before, you'll hear these pauses, right, where I'm, I'm sitting here talking, and uh, all of a sudden there'll be a pause. And it's a pause because I have to, like, catch my breath. I have to go, 
I don't know. I don't know what that is, but it's, you can actually look it up. There are people who just they're 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 wired this way. So normally when I'm when I'm watching when I'm watching videos, I watch videos where there's an actual person talking to me there. I don't watch videos where it's it's like stuff stuff on the stuff on the screen. Um, so I'm 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 wondering what the intent here is. David, do you have anything against Christian yeah. Prince? What Sam, have you ever heard me say two words about Christian Prince? Yeah. Ever heard me say in one fact, negative uh, word about Christian Prince? And I mean yeah. we we've been no, we've been cool. working together for. I don't know how long. No, 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 no. no. And that's why I, I just want to tell that person, if he's a Christian, I say this lovingly, you need to stop instigating because you just took about five minutes out of our precious time that we can use to answer questions on how to reach Muslims and refute Islam and defend Christianity because you keep going on this rant. Do you have something against Christian Prince? Please stop this nonsense. Please stop being used of the enemy to cause division. Let's focus on the issues. We just praise Christian Prince as a soldier used of the Lord. Leave it be. Why should David waste about three, four minutes of his time defending himself and explaining his phobia when that time can be used to glorify Christ? So please, Christians, stop. Let's focus on the issues. Let's go to something relevant. And any questions? Oh, here's Come one. On. Here's, here's, here's one. Oh, yes, yeah, Sam, it's actually uh, the, the, the questions... The problem is that, that questions come so fast that when I see one, it, it, it sort of disappears really quickly. They, they come so fast and I have to go back and, and try and find it. But uh, I just saw this one. These two are not experts. They get paid by Jews to preach hate against God's true religion, Islam. These two are crypto Jews, Judas. Wow. Hmm. Go figure. I didn't know I was Jewish. And by the way, just to let you know, years ago, someone told me he's a Pakistani Christian. He said in Pakistan, they actually took a, took a front page ad in the newspapers mm -hmm. warning about entering Islam because they claim two Jews are running it, Yochan Katz, Sam Shamoon, because Katz sounds like a Jewish last name and so does Shamoon. Mm -hmm. So, hey, I didn't – well, hey, one, well, I did know I'm a spiritual Jew because of Jesus Christ. I belong to Abraham, but I had no clue that I was ethnically Jewish. And with these recent DNA studies, who knows? I may be Jewish and American Indian. Who knows? But mm – -hmm. As far as I know, I'm a handsome Assyrian from Nineveh. Don't yeah. hate. You know what's uh, you, you know what's interesting here, um, and we we see this, we see this over and over again, right? In in Christian apologetics, the Christian uh, the the goal of the Christian apologetic of the Christian apologist is to show that he's got a good argument and that the opposition doesn't have a good argument. The goal of uh, Islamic apologists is, is usually to discredit the other person, right? To say, don't listen to what this person's argument is because he's bad for this reason that we'll make up. Right? Yeah. And so don't listen to Sam Shamoon. Why? Because he gets paid by Jews to preach hate yeah. against God's true religion. So don't listen to him. He's just getting paid by Jews. Now, Sam, are you getting paid by Jews to, to, to refute Islam? Man, bro, if if I'm getting paid, I haven't seen it yet. Please send, tell him send it. I'll I'll even start a PO box. Send me the money. Yeah, Sam, don't don't you think we could we'd be making more money doing about anything else in the entire world? And that's one thing you can testify. I struggle financially because we're not doing it to get rich. So boy, if there are Jews who want to send me money, hey, send me. As long as you let me preach Jesus, yeah, the Jewish we're, style. We're actually doing a, we're doing a. I'm talking about we. My family's doing much better because people have been supporting us yeah. on 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 Patreon and so on. We've been doing much better than we were like seven or eight years ago when things got so bad for us that I had to send my oldest two sons to live with their grandparents See? because we yeah. could we couldn't pay for food for them because why? Because I'm sitting there going, uh, no, I ha I have to do this. I have to I have to do uh, apologetics dealing with Islam when you're you're kind of out in no man's land, right? Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, you know, atheist organizations and other organizations like that, secular organizations, they don't want to come near you because you're, you're, you're too Christian, right? You're too, we're, we're too Christian. We're Christian apologists. But most Christian ministries don't want to come near you either because you're, yeah. you're aggressive towards Islam and everyone's going to call you a, a bigot and an Islamophobe. So you're kind of out in the middle of, of nowhere with no actual, like, organization uh, backing you, and historically, if you were going to be an apologist, you would you, you would want to be attached to some other organization, uh, some other ministry that's going to you know take you and uh, and support you so that you can go out and do apolo apologetics. And uh, when once once you go this route, though, once you go this route, you end up in a kind of no man's land. Yes. You know, we kind of uh, 
um, I'm, I'm saying this because this is actually this is actually we're in one of the coolest eras of history right now because there's a kind of revolution going on, right? There's a revolution going on where um, historically, historically, if you wanted to be an apologist, that's you, you had to go. You had, you had to either do apologetics as as something you did on the side. In other words, you have you have a career, you have your job and then you come home and then you do some apologetics when you get home. Or if you wanted to do apologetics full time, you had to be you had to be picked up by by some sort of ministry, right? You had to be you had to be part of a ministry. Um, whereas with Islam, that became very very hard to do, just because everyone's calling you bigot and racist and things like that. Uh, and if you so if you wanted to be aggressive towards Islam, um, if you really wanted to point out the problems in Islam, m- most Christian ministries didn't want to go near you, and you can't really do anything else. And that even got that got so bad that Keep in, keep in mind, you know, I, I know I've made some very hard hitting videos over the years, but even before that, just when I was going around debating, right, I was, but before I put all this stuff on YouTube, and I was just going around debating Muslims, I would show up to speak at a church. I showed up to speak at this one church one time, and a, a, the, the pastor came up to me and said, we got 15 complaints from Muslims uh, about you speaking here. Wow. Right? And I was thinking... Wow. If, 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 and I'm, I'm just getting started, right? I was just getting started. And they were all, already getting those kinds of, kinds of complaints. That actually affected my entire like, career choices. I have a PhD in philosophy. Normally, if you have a PhD in philosophy, you would go on to teach philosophy at a university. You become a professor. I was thinking, if I'm going to go that route, I can't be talking about Islam the way I do. I can't do yeah. it. I can't do it. Because, I mean, if, if I can't go speak at a church without getting a bunch of complaints, what's going to happen at the university I'm teaching at? They're going to, get, they're going to be getting complaints all day long. And so they would have to really, really love me to keep me there. But the fact is, people don't want that kind of drama. Administrators don't want that kind of drama. They don't have, to, they don't want to have to deal with someone who's going to be accused of being a, a bigot the entire time. And so, um, the so I, I had to take that into account. If if I want to actually go into philosophy as a career and uh, be teaching classes and so on, I have to not be saying the kinds of things I'm saying about Islam and really not be saying anything about Islam at all. I have to just pull completely back and hope that everyone leaves me alone. Um, But I just couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. Um, So it was, instead, let me burn all bridges behind me and just keep going after Islam. It's going to burn all those bridges. And that was hard for a while. But I I said that we're in the middle of a revolution because if we're getting to a point in history where... um, People who want to shut you down because you're speaking about Islam. People who want to shut you down. In a Muslim country, they just chop your head off or throw you in prison for blasphemy or something like that. They do something that. Um, the same people want to control your speech over here. They can't do it by chopping off your head, usually. So they'll try and like destroy your career, destroy your life to make it so that no one wants to go on and do any, any of these kinds of things. Um, so that's the, that's the goal. But if we're entering a stage of history where... Uh, people who would be shut down at a school or would be shut down uh, whatever else they're doing can come on the internet and do it here and people can actually crowdfund them and support them. Yeah. Guess what? If you, if you don't shut, if you can't shut us, it, the, their next goal would be to shut us down on the internet to get, to get everyone yeah. deplatformed who criticizes Islam. But if they can't do that, if they're not able to shut you down on the internet, they're going to lose because now if if you if you shut someone down at his university, if you shut someone down at a school and he just says, fine, I'll go I'll go and do it on the Internet. All they're going to do is end up making tons of really, really popular Internet apologists who can then speak to people around the world, not just speak to 30 people in a classroom or or 50 or 100 people in a church. They'll be, they'll be reaching people around the world. So that's what I mean. As long as as long as the complainers do not shut us down on the internet oh we're gonna we're gonna win this one by the grace of god i pray in jesus name they don't so let's pray for that because it's getting scary what they're trying to do on the internet because you're talking about patron and shutting down accounts by people who speak against islam so i pray that doesn't happen you know yep so we'll see. says muhammad yeah. is in the bible but as a false prophet he's responding to someone who's saying that muhammad is in, in the bible he said yeah. that muhammad is in the bible but as a false prophet. Yeah. Do you agree well, with that? I mean, well, yeah. I mean, when, when you say he's in the Bible, the Bible does warn about false prophets and antichrists, and Muhammad fits the profile of a false prophet and antichrist to a T. I'll just give you two passages. 
<clears throat> if you guys want to see what the criteria happen to be for a false prophet antichrist, Matthew 7, 15 to 20 talks about by their fruits you shall know them, right? <clears throat> and it talks about the evil rotten fruit of a false prophet. Examine the life of Muhammad, his fruits are rotten to the core. But another one that's relevant to Muhammad is 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 to 23. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 to 23, where it says, The Antichrist is the one who denies the Father and the Son. He who has the Son has the Father. He who denies the Son denies the Father. So, an Antichrist is someone says, God is not the Father, Jesus is not his Son. Muhammad comes and says, Allah is not the Father, Jesus is not his Son. He then <clears throat> is one of the Antichrists that the Bible said would enter the world and already entered the world. And a lot of people don't know this. So I want to emphasize to the students of the Bible, Christians who love Jesus. There's not just one Antichrist. There are many Antichrists. First John 2.18, John says, My dear children, you have heard it's the last hour, and the Antichrist is coming. And many Antichrists have already come into the world. Many Antichrists have come into the world. Muhammad happens to be one of them, and in my estimation, He's the most vicious, the most wicked, the most evil of all the Antichrist to date. Right? Now, if you believe there's a final Antichrist will appear, he'll outdo Muhammad. But up until now, I have yet to see an Antichrist more wicked, more evil than he is. So, Matthew 7, 15 to 20, 1 John 2, 20 to 23. And you can also use Galatians 1, 6 to 9. If we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one which we have preached to you, may he be... Anathema, eternally condemned. Notice he says, even if an angel appears preaching a different gospel, Muhammad and Joseph Smith claimed an angel came to them preaching a different gospel. So that's Galatians 1, 6 to 9, specifically 8 to 9. And my favorite, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 to 15, because there Paul warns about false apostles masquerading as ministers of righteousness who preach another Jesus from the one we preach, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 to 15, present a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel. And then he says, no wonder, for Satan himself appears as an angel of light. So too do his ministers appear as ministers of righteousness. Now I want to hammer that. Here Paul tells you that a false prophet won't necessarily go about doing evil. He'll put on a facade, like Satan puts on the mask of an angel of light, you can have a false prophet who's very pious, who promotes holiness and righteousness, but that's a facade. Now, the good thing about Muhammad, his life speaks of how evil, how cruel, how immoral he was. So there was no facade with him. It's warts and all, right? But there are people out there who will give the pretext of being pious and holy, but they're false prophets. So don't be impressed by someone's piousness or holiness or humbleness. Because these are all facade. It's a facade <clears throat> Satan inspires to deceive people from the true God. So hope that answered the question. Mm -hmm. no. and, 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 you know, as you pointed out, I mean, Muhammad, more than anyone else in history, if you, which is amazing because the Quran is pointing to the Bible as confirmation of Muhammad. And yet no one in history fits these descriptions of a false prophet more perfectly than Muhammad. If you look at, you know, false prophets come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves, ravenous wolves. Muhammad, when he came to the Christians and Jews, hey, Christians and Jews, I'm on your side. It's the polytheists I disagree with. And then a few years later, oh, all of you have to be violently subjugated and pay me money or I'll chop your heads off. I mean, you can't you can't be a more perfect wolf in sheep's clothing than yeah. Muhammad was. And lying. so it's just it's just ironic that Muhammad would point to the Bible and say, there's the book that, that talks about me. Yeah, it sure does. Yep, exactly. It exposes you as the child of Satan that you are. I know this may sound harsh to Muslims, but mm -hmm. matter of factly, and I'm speaking truthfully, he was a son of Satan. Mm -hmm. All false prophets, antichrist, belong to the devil. Because the Bible is quite clear. You're either a child of God or a child of the evil one. Now, you can be a child of Satan and by the grace of God become a child of God if you turn to Jesus Christ, which Muhammad never did. And therefore, he's one of the children of Satan that Satan raised up to mislead mankind. This is just what the Bible teaches. So don't shoot the messenger. We're just telling you what the Bible, our authority, says about Muhammad or Joseph Smith and all the other false prophets and antichrists. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, here's one. It's actually an interesting one. 
Why don't you address Shia Islam? Shiites will disagree to will disregard your arguments because they don't relate to them like they do to the Sunnis due to different hadith books and interpretations. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and respond for myself, and then Sam can give his thoughts. But um, uh, we, we focus much more on Sunni uh, Islam because Sunni Islam is, is, most Muslims are Sunnis, right? You're talking about 85% of Muslims globally are yep. Sunnis. And so if you want to deal with Islam, you would, you would tend to focus on that. Um, the Shia sources... Uh, came out a, a bit more recently as far as making them available in, in translation. So uh, like I have uh, al Kafi and so on. Um, so the, the, the Sunni sources were, were more readily available when we started studying Islam. So it was much easier to get Sahih al-Bukhari than it was to get uh, the Shia uh, collection al Kafi. And so started working on that. But you just tend to focus on uh, Sunni Islam because it's much more it's much more prevalent. If you're talking to a Shia Muslim, yeah, you can go through their sources, but you don't need to. You can just use Quran based arguments. Right. right. So nor, nor, yeah, normally, if I'm if I'm talking to a Shia Muslim, you can use, you know, you can use the Islamic dilemma. You can just, you can point out issues with the Quran. So you don't have to you don't have to know the Hadith very well in order to talk to Shias. You just adapt your arguments for, from the Quran. Yeah, precisely. In fact, there's nothing for me to add. You said everything I was going to say. Exactly. Majority sect, they're Sunni, and unfortunately, Shia source, source, uh, sources are not completely translated in English. But like you said, you don't need to know their sources. Just use the Quran and the arguments from the Quran to prove the truth of Christianity. In fact, by way of testimony, could you mention this? Years ago, uh, I met a gentleman named Ahlul Bayt Ali. I met him on Pal Talk. Now, he said he was a Shia Muslim. Now, this is where it gets kind of baffling, because depending on which Shia you ask, some will tell you the Quran is eternal. Some will say, no, it's created. They've adopted the Mutezilite position on the nature of the Quran. But this particular Shia did believe the Quran was uncreated. Now, unfortunately, that session wasn't recorded. But I did the similar session on Paltok with another Muslim who actually made the same concession. That was recorded. It's on YouTube. But anyway, he was attacking the Trinity as being irrational, incoherent. And I said, well, you have a Trinity of your own. And I mentioned Allah the Quran as the uncreated speech of Allah and the spirit of Allah. And I went through the arguments. And at the end of the discussion in front of a room full of Christians, he admitted, he goes, you're right. We Muslims have our own trinity, though not identical to yours. It's still a trinity nonetheless. So if I'm going to be consistent, I have to stop attacking the coherence of the trinity as affirmed by Christians, because then I'm going to have to reject my faith. Now, I hadn't seen him after that. I hadn't seen him for about six months. So about six months later, I saw him on Pal Talk. Now, glory to God. Praise the Lord. Now, I don't take credit for this. Glory to God for using William Lane Craig. As you remember last time, David, I praised William Lane Craig for being used so mightily by God to lead atheists and Muslims to the truth. I saw him on Pal Talk. I said, hey, man, what's going on? He said, hey, I just want you to know I'm no longer a Muslim. I go, what happened? He goes, I'm a Christian. Since our talk, I started watching lectures and debates on the historicity of the resurrection, and I started watching William Lane Craig. I'm now convinced that Jesus did die on the cross and was raised back to life. Therefore, I'm a Christian. He goes, the only thing I'm now looking into is which branch of Christianity should I embrace. So glory to God. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. I pray we see millions of those kind of testimonies all over the world falling in love with King Jesus, their only hope of salvation. Oh, and, and that's the other reason I say that we're in the we're in the middle of a, a revolution right now, right? So for for basically for 14 centuries, Muslim leaders have been able to keep Muslims insulated from hearing criticisms of Islam or from hearing a serious presentation of an alternative to Islam. And yet we get down to our time right now, and all of a sudden, any Muslim with an internet connection has open access to endless uh, criticisms about Muhammad and to uh, presentations of alternatives to Islam, and so we're in a we're in a new phase of history. This just started. I mean, you're talking about things that have happened in the last ten to twelve years where we can now do this, and so uh, it's just amazing to me that if you look at you look at the statistics and the demographics, um, if nothing changes based on the, the the birth rates in Islam, Islam is supposed to surpass Christianity yeah. globally within the next few decades. And so you're looking at that, and that's depressing, but, but you sit down and, and think, wait a minute, God is sovereign here. 
and God is sovereign and right before, just a few decades away from Islam dominating, we get handed everything we need to refute and undermine Islam, right? We all of a sudden we get open access to their sources. We get open access to Muslims around the world. We can talk to them uh, whether we're whether we're here. If you're in if you're in Europe or the United States, you can talk to you can talk to Muslims in your area with no problem. But uh, you, we're in a time where you can pick up you can pick up your phone and talk to a, I mean you can pick up your cell phone and talk to a Muslim, in Saudi Arabia on Facebook if you want. Right, 14 centuries of Christians couldn't have dreamed of these kinds of opportunities uh, to witness to Muslims, and all of a sudden it's wide open for us. And so these are very, very cool times. So Sam, you said you wanted to see many more, many more people come to Christ. I believe we are going to see more Muslims come to Christ in our lifetimes than all previous generations combined have been able to see. In Jesus' name, may we be that generation to see a multitude of them come to fall in love with Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. May I see it before the Lord comes or takes me home? All right. So we got about uh, maybe uh, 10 or 12 more minutes, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, yep. Well, I guess we started a couple minutes late, so we'll probably go, yeah, we'll probably go right till about 10 o'clock or so. Uh, so Chris Adam here says, So the Quran was memorized by Muhammad and by his own Arab followers. They okay. all came together and produced a Quran which they agreed upon, so there is no falsity. Now, Sam, we... We've read the Muslim sources on how the Quran was compiled. Does that sound like what you would get, the picture you would get from reading the Muslim sources? Far from it. That's why I'm laughing. Is this gentleman a Muslim? Because the name sounded like maybe, I hope he's not a convert, and he bought into the Muslim hype. I mean, David, you've got you and the late Nabil, who's now with Jesus Christ. You did an excellent short video on this, quoting the primary sources of Islam. <clears throat> To say that they all agreed regarding what the Quran is, that is one of the biggest hoaxes yep. foisted upon uh, the, the masses because the sources themselves testify. Muhammad's own companions almost came to blows and killed one another over the exact, exact content of the Quran. Now, I'll let you take over and just mention a few things because this is... Ah, all right. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, let me give you a, first of all, there's, there's the general point, namely that uh, it's just depressing that Muslim leaders, and this goes back to the problem I just mentioned, that for 14 centuries, Muslim leaders have been able to keep people insulated, to, to only hear what they want them to hear, right? And so the, the tendency was to praise all things Islamic more and more. So if you're praising Muhammad, you, you just keep praising him more and more. If you're talking about the Quran, you just keep praising it more and more. And it doesn't matter if you're accurate as long as you're just uh, saying wonderful things about the Quran. Um, and the problem is that now you've got all these Muslims walking around believing in these things. And it's absolute nonsense. Not according to me, not according to Sam Shamoon, according to your own Muslim sources, right? Um, so according to your Muslim sources, Muhammad named four people. He said, if you want to learn the recitation of the Quran from anyone, learn it from these four. And he had some interesting people on that list. The uh, two of the people, two of the people on that list of his four top reciters of the Quran, uh, Abdullah ibn Masud and Ubay ibn Kab. Now, why is this relevant? Well, Abdullah ibn Masud did not agree with the Quran you have today. Abdullah ibn Masud did not believe that the prayers that you find in the Quran today are supposed to be part of the Quran. So Surah 1, Surah 113, and Surah 114 are not supposed to be in the Quran. Ibn Masud had 111 chapters in his Quran. Ubay ibn Kab did believe that the prayer should be in there, and he had two additional chapters. So Ubay ibn Kab had 116 surahs in his Quran. Your Quran today has 114 surahs. So notice, these two guys that Muhammad named as two of his top reciters did not agree with the Quran that you have today. And so here's Muhammad saying, now, by the way, this puts you in a, a different kind of dilemma because there's a, there's a problem here. Either Muhammad knew who, knew who his best reciters of the Quran were or, or he didn't. He was just, he was clueless. If Muhammad did know who the actual best reciters of his Quran were, well, guess what? They didn't agree with the Quran you have today. So, so, Muhammad's top, so the people that Muhammad affirmed as his top guys, they didn't agree with the Quran you have today. Or the Quran you have today is right and Muhammad just didn't know. Who the top who who really knew his Quran? He just right. didn't know. He couldn't get that right, and so he, even Muhammad himself did, Muhammad himself got the Quran wrong by affirming the wrong people. 
Um, so what you have here, what you have in the actual Muslim sources is you had all sorts of different recitations because Islam expands rapidly. There are people going out and fighting. Um, the purpose in the early days of Islam of, of writing the Quran down at all seems to have been as aids to memory, right? So when Muhammad recited something and one of his followers would write it on a piece of bone or on a, uh, or on a leaf or something like that, the point wasn't to compile a book. It was you'd have something to go back to your tent and memorize a, a passage from. Um, so there wasn't much of an emphasis on having the Quran as a, a, a physical book. You wanted to memorize it. Um, but as Islam spread, you ended up with all these different competing recitations of the Quran. And as far as all the Muslims getting together and coming up with a, a version they all agreed with, absolute nonsense, right? Exactly. Uthman had to order everyone to hand their stuff over and burn everything else and issue authoritative versions and uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Masud called the Quran that you recite today a deception. He told his followers to hide their Qurans from Uthman, burning them, right? Now, what sense does that make if he affirmed the Quran that you have today? And so just notice, I mean, you, you've, if we had anything like this in Christianity, a, a Christian leader ordering everyone to hand over their Bible so that he could burn them all, and issue his authoritative version, we would never hear the end of this. But you don't have anything like that in Christianity. You had, you had copies of, uh, of the Gospels and the letters of Paul circulating, and no one was ever in a position to corrupt it everywhere. Right? So that's why it doesn't work when you say the Bible's been corrupted. Guess what? If you, if you write a, a corrupt copy of the Gospel of John in Alexandria, that doesn't corrupt a copy in Rome, you can't, you can't do it. There was no centralized authority that, that was capable of even doing that. In Islam, you did have a centralized authority. And he was telling people who had, who had very different versions of the Quran with different chapters to hand over their copies so he could burn them and then force them to accept his new version. If we had anything like that in Christianity, you would say, this is clear, clear, clear proof of the corruption of your text. But we don't have anything like that. You guys have that. And your leaders, guess what? Sam, have their leaders, have their Muslim leaders who tell them, oh, it's perfect preservation, and the, and the Muslims who had it all memorized, they all got together and came out with a version they could all agree with. Yeah. Till this day, you hear that from Muslim scholars. Yeah. Now, now, now those, Mus those Muslim scholars, have they read the same sources that we've read? Definitely they have. So they, they, have they, they know what, what, what we read in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. They, they know that according to Abu Musa and Sahih Muslim, two entire chapters of the Quran were lost because Muslims hardened their hearts and didn't recite them enough. They, they know that? Most definitely. Otherwise, they cannot be considered a scholar because not only do, must they memorize the Quran, they must memorize the hadiths mm -hmm. to be qualified as a Sunni scholar. So most definitely they know all this information. So okay. they know this information, and yet they tell Muslims, perfect preservation right down to the letter, and all the Muslims, they, they had it all memorized, and they got together, and they just came out with a book that they all agreed with. Yep, that's what they do. Yeah, so, remember, so, so they know, they're, they know they're, they're deceiving Muslims, but it's for the greater good. Yeah, because you can lie in this religion. You and I have done shows on this. We post on this. In Islam, you're allowed to lie, deceive, mislead, connive <clears throat> for the spread of Islam in order to accomplish your agenda of subjugating people to the rule of Allah and his messenger. Of course, that's part of the religion. We know this. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, it is. Yeah, and, and here, here, here's, here's what's amazing, by the way. The, in, the entire purpose of composing and compiling the Quran as a book was because of so much, that so much of it had been lost, right? Abu Bakr came up with the most brilliant military strategy of all time, if Islam is true. Yeah. He, 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 sent, he, sent all, he sent all the people who had the Quran memorized into battle. And obviously, if Allah is going to protect the Quran, he's going to protect this army, and this army will, will be invincible. And a bunch of them got slaughtered. They eventually won, but they, a bunch of them got slaughtered. A bunch of the Quran was lost. It's not according to us. This is according to Muslim sources. A bunch of the Quran was lost. Abu Bakr didn't want more of the Quran to be lost, so he said, we actually need a physical copy. Let's have right. someone sit down and write a physical copy so that we don't lose even more of the Quran. Now, Sam, if all of these Muslims just had the Quran memorized. Why would you be afraid? Yeah, what, 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 would you, what are you talking about? All the Muslims have the Quran memorized. Yeah, why would you? Because, and yet Muslim, again, source, Muslim sources are saying much of the Quran was lost in this battle and no one else had these passages memorized. 
Precisely. Interesting what you just said because people don't know that Muhammad said that all innov innovation, bid'ah, is evil. If you innovate in this religion, it's evil. The very sources, Bukhari, that mentions this compilation done under the order of Abu Bakr. You know this, I'm preaching mm -hmm. to the choir, but to benefit everyone else. It was actually Umar ibn al-Khattab, who eventually became the second caliph, who told Abu Bakr, you need to collect the Quran between two covers because the slaughter of the memorizers of the Quran on the day of battle was great. And we're going to lose the Quran if we don't collect it between two volumes. Now, Abu Bakr said, he said, you want me to do something that Allah's messenger did not do. Mm -hmm. Hey, Allah's messenger did not compile the Quran between two covers in a codex. Something that's in innovation. So you want me to innovate? And Omar says, yes, if we're going to preserve the Quran. And then Zayd ibn Thabit, the scribe that was assigned the task of electing Quran, he said the same thing. He said to Abu Bakr, you want me mm -hmm. to do something that Allah's Messenger didn't do. In other words, Muslims, your modern day Quran is one of the greatest innovations foisted on the Muslim world. And according to Muhammad, all innovation is bad. Therefore, your Quran is not good. It's bad if Muhammad is to be believed. Mm -hmm. Let me All just right. uh, let me just read a couple of quotations here. This is from Ibn Saad's Kitab. Al Tabakat Al Kabir. Ibn Masud said this quotation from Ibn Masud: "The people, the people have been guilty of deceit in the reading of the Quran. I like it better to read according to the recitation of him, i.e., Muhammad, whom I love more than that of Zayd Ibn Thabit." By him besides whom there is no God, I learnt more than 70 surahs from the lips of, a, of the Apostle of Allah, may Allah bless him, while Zayd ibn Thabit was a youth, having two locks and playing with the youth. So, this is, this is Abdullah ibn Masud saying, right. wait a minute, Zayd ibn Thabit is the guy who's in charge of putting together our new Quran? I had 70 surahs of the Quran memorized when he's a little kid, running around playing with sticks. Why are you putting him in charge of this? Right? Instead of one of us, we, the people that Muhammad said, know the Quran better than anyone else, and you're, you're, you're picking this guy? All right. Now, notice what he says. The people have been guilty of deceit in the reading of the Quran. Abdullah ibn Masud calls your Quran a deception. You better believe it. Now, now notice, notice, wait a minute. I thought all the Muslims agreed. They, 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 they sat down and got together and came up with a with a version of the Quran they could all get behind. No, that's, not what your, that's not what your sources say. Yeah. Your, your sources say that, that the people who were actually Muhammad's top reciters of the Quran were saying, no, don't do this, but there, there's nothing they could do about it because you can't go against your Islamic ruler. Or he's going to chop your head off and accuse you of being an apostate. One more from Jamiat Termidi, 3104. This is from Ibn Masud again. He says, oh, you Muslim people, avoid copying the mushaf and recitation of this man. Referring to Zayd ibn Thabit. By Abort. Allah, when I accepted Islam, he was but in the loins of a disbelieving man, meaning Zayd ibn Thabit. And it was regarding this that Abdullah ibn Masud said, O people of al-Iraq, keep the musahif that are with you and conceal them. So he says, avoid copying the Quran of this man. Wh which Quran is that? Well, that's the Quran that's, that, that your Quran is ultimately descended from. That's so right. avoid copying that. He calls it a deception. He tells the people of Iraq to keep their own Qurans, not that Quran. What do your leaders tell you? Perfect preservation right down to the letter. No disagreement from any Muslim at any time in all of history. Oh boy. Now notice we're actually we're actually we're actually quoting Muslim sources. Let me give you again, just just because it, uh, we're trying to give you sources so you can look up any of these. Sahih al-Bukhari, 5505. Umar said, Ubay was the best of us in the recitation of the Quran. Yet we leave some of what he says. Ubay responds, I have taken it from the mouth of Allah's messenger and will not leave, any, leave it for anything whatsoever. So here's, think about the funny situation. Umar is saying, Ubay ibn Kab, he's our best reciter, but we have to leave off some of his recitation because we've got a, well, why? You've got a different recitation of the Quran, right? He's got extra things yeah. in his Quran. He's got entire extra chapters. He's got extra phrases. He's got all kinds of extra things. So we have to leave off some of that. And Ubay's response is, I heard it from the mouth of Allah's messenger. I'm not going to leave that. But, but no disagreement ever in the Quran, Never. right? That's what your leaders tell you. This is, 
This is Umar, the second rightly guided caliph in Sahih al-Bukhari, your most authoritative hadith collection, referring to Ubay ibn Kab, one of Muhammad's top reciters of the Quran. They all say that your leaders are lying to you, and you say, I'm going to believe my leaders anyway. I'm, uh, uh, who cares what, 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 what I read from Umar and Ubay ibn Kab in Sahih al-Bukhari? Don't care about that. Don't care about what any of our Muslim sources say. We only care about what our leaders tell us to mindlessly believe in the face of all the evidence that completely refutes us. Now, Dave, you know what's even better than all that? What's that? Better? The Quran itself, itself testifies that the Quran was being corrupted even in the time of its composition. In chapter 15, people may be shocked to read this. Chapter 15, verses 90 and 91, David, read. If you, if you reject the Hadiths, okay, yep. well, I don't believe in Bukhari Muslim. All right, let's put that aside. The Quran testifies people were corrupting it during the time of its composition. Mm -hmm. Chapter 15, verses 90 91. David, read it for the audience. Let's All right. Um, of just such wrath as we sent down on those who divided Scripture into arbor arbitrary parts, so also on those as have made the Quran into shreds as mm. they please. That's the Yusuf Ali. That's the Yusuf Ali translation. So also on those as have made the Quran into shreds. The M.H. Shakir says, those who have made the Quran into shreds. Mm. And uh, I like Palmer the best here. He says, those who dismember the Quran. The Quran's, Quran's, been, your Quran's Quran. been dismembered. Wow. This is during the time of its composition? It's at the time of Surah 15. So then that means not only are the Hadiths telling us the Quran is corrupted, the Quran is confirming the Hadiths because the Quran is already testifying to people who are dismembering it, tearing it to shreds. Mm -hmm. End of stories. And yet you still want to convince us the Quran has been perfectly preserved. Okay. Maybe in your world, or maybe you have a different definition of preservation. I don't know. Yep. All right. Uh, we'll have uh, probably one more here, and then we'll close out. Yeah. I don't know how much time we have. I did see someone mentioning Jesus being sent to the lost tribe of Israel only, but whatever. If you have another question, you feel free, because I know our time is winding down. So if you have another question, let me know. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, the one the one I just put on the screen was from Alex uh, Gaskin. He says, David and Sam, is it okay for a Trinitarian to interpret Genesis 126 in a royal sense rather than a strict Trinitarian sense? So can a Trinitarian, someone who believes that the doctrine of the Trinity is scriptural, but based on uh, various other passages, um, can he still say that Genesis 126 uh, is just the royal sense there rather than a trinitarian sense yeah well, let me give you chime in give you my two cents mm -hmm. now when you say is it okay well a trinitarian can do anything he wants i mean mm -hmm. but if you're asking me can someone interpret the plural there as the plural of majesty the royal plural and be faithful to the historical culture context of genesis 1 no because the royal plural was unheard of in biblical hebrew mm -hmm. so if you ask me can you interpret well you can interpret the bible any way you want but if you want to be faithful to its historical, cultural, grammatical context, this, the so-called usage, royal plural, the plural of majesty, is unattested in biblical Hebrew. In fact, it's even unattested in Arabic, especially the time of the Quran's composition. When a king said I, he meant I. When he said we, he's either referring to the court, but definitely he's not referring to himself. He's referring to more than one individual. So there is no clear-cut, unambiguous example of the royal plural in biblical Hebrew. Now, you can easily prove me wrong by citing an example, and even scholars admit that is a usage unattested at the time of the composition of not just Genesis, but the Old Testament as a whole, even in the New Testament. So, if you want to be faithful to history and context, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. All right, and Sam, you said there was, there was one other you wanted to address? Yeah, I don't know if we're going to have time because that, that will maybe entail at least a five, six, maybe seven minute response. It's about misquoting, as they always do. Maybe we can do another session on that. I mean, if, or, if, you, if you want to take five minutes, we can go five minutes. We, we, start, we started like ten minutes late, so it'll, okay. still, it'll still be under two hours. Okay, because so if you, as you can see from my face and even David's face, and he does a better job of putting up with it, sometimes you see I get so tired and frustrated hearing the same canards over and over again. But I know there are people who are just hearing this for the first time, may not have been exposed to these objections, and so for their benefit, I'll answer. The passage that he's referring to, see, I'm even getting tired thinking about it, is Matthew 15, 24. 
Jesus says, I've been sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. <clears throat> now, Lord willing, in a future session, I'm going to show how even the Quran itself and the Hadiths testify Jesus' mission is universal in scope, mm -hmm. that he's a sign and a mercy for all mankind. In fact, let's just real quickly look at one passage of the Quran that mm -hmm. affirms that the Quran does not limit Jesus' ministry only to the Jews. If you don't mind, David, if you have the Quran, go to chapter 19, verse 21. What does it say about the scope, the extent of Jesus' influence and ministry in chapter 19, verse 21? Mm -hmm. uh, he said, So it will be, the Lord saith, It is easy for me, and it will be that we may make of him a revelation for mankind and a mercy from us, and it is a thing ordained. Does it say a revelation to the Jews and a mercy from us to them, or a revelation and a mercy for mankind? Revelation for mankind or a sign for mankind. Yeah, and a mercy too. So yeah, the Quran mercy. itself does not limit Jesus' ministry to the Jews. And mm -hmm. Lord willing, in a future session, mm -hmm. we'll unpack that because what's more important is what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. It is true that in Matthew 15, 24, Jesus did say that he was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And here's why. As far as Jesus' earthly ministry is concerned, while he's on earth, he limits himself to the heirs of the covenant. Why? Because the covenant was made with the Israelites. So he's announcing to them the fulfillment of the covenant promises because he comes to fulfill all that the law and the prophets said he would fulfill in respect to the first coming where he would die for our sins and rise glorious to sit in throne as Lord of all creation. But does that mean that Jesus would not send his apostles? and the power of the Holy Spirit to reach all nations after Jesus fulfilled his earthly mission to the Jews. Since you're quoting Matthew, I'm just going to use Matthew. You can't just quote the parts of Matthew you like and ignore the other parts that refute your misinterpretation of the point of Jesus in the context of Matthew. Mm -hmm. Do me a favor. Yep. Can you go to Matthew 10? Get 5 and 6 real quick because he limits the ministry of his apostles to the Jews during that period as well. Mm -hmm. There are other times where he lets them go to the Samaritans. Yep. Let's go to Matthew 10, 5 and 6. And we're just going to use Matthew. We're going to finish with Matthew. These 12 say? Jesus sent out, charging them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Aha! Mm -hmm. See, even Jesus' followers are only for the Jews. We mm -hmm. got you. You need Muhammad. Allah Akbar. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's just continue. Can you read for me 17 and 18 of the same chapter? Matthew 10, 17 and 18. Same chapter. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear testimony before them and the Gentiles. No, no, no. That's a typo, bro. That's a variant. You got a corrupt manuscript and to the lost sheep of Israel. What are you talking about? So Jesus is already preparing them for their greater mission. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm limiting you to the Jews, but the time will come where you'll be a witness to the Gentiles for my sake. That same chapter, right? Mm -hmm. Now, again, for the sake of brevity and time, go to Matthew 12, 17 to 21. Matthew 12, here, Matthew cites Isaiah 42, irony of ironies. Isaiah 42 is the one prophecy that all Muslims say is about Muhammad, a prophet from Kedar. Mm -hmm. Yet, according to Matthew, Isaiah 42 is fulfilled in Jesus. Now read Matthew 12, 17 to 21. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not wrangle... No, no, no. Lost sheep of Israel, man. What's mm -hmm. wrong with you? Justice to the Gentiles. Keep going. He will not wrangle or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoldering wick till he brings justice to victory. And in his name will the Gentiles hope. Are you sure it said Gentiles? Yeah, that must be you a typo. Me. Man, it's a variant. Rate. That same gospel, Matthew? Mm -hmm. Well, let's finish it with the last two examples. Matthew 24, 14. Last two and we're done. So please, Muslims, stop misquoting Matthew and stop quoting Matthew 15, 24 out of context. Mm -hmm. Matthew 24, 14. Again, the Lord prepares his disciples for the greater mission of reaching the nations for the glory of Christ. In Matthew 24, 14, what does it say? And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will oh. come. 
So Jesus, although himself on earth, physically limited himself to Israel, which makes sense. They're the ones who received the covenant promises. So I'm coming to them to announce to them, hey guys, I'm here to fulfill the promises. Now that I've done that part, I will send the disciples in the power of the Spirit to now be a witness to all nations, which is how Matthew concludes, Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. And 20 says, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. So please, the last place you want to go to to limit Jesus' ministry is Matthew, when Matthew's already told you in chapter 2, who came looking for the boy Jesus to worship him? Mm -hmm. The Magi from the East, Gentiles. He's already prepared you for the Gentile mission. So, so much for that objection. So you didn't think that's a very good objection? Uh, man, I almost took Shahada. That's how powerful it was. And uh, this, is, this is really just amazing. So you've got the Quran affirming that Jesus is a sign for mankind, mankind in general. And then Muslims will go to a book which over and over and over again says that basically that Jesus has a mission first to his fellow Jews, but that his message is going to be spread throughout the entire world among the Gentiles. They'll ignore everything, just focus on lost sheep of Israel and say, therefore, you see it, this isn't supposed to be a, this isn't supposed to be a, a Christian religion with Gentiles. It's just, he was just a prophet to his fellow Jews. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah. and 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 here here here's what's amazing, Sam. There are there are some Muslims. You can point this out to them, right? Because they hear this thing, they hear this from their apologists all their lives, and they think, "Well, I've really got a, a good point to use against my Christian friends." I say, "Ha! Right here it says right in your own Bible, Jesus is only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel." Yeah. And they'll tell them that, right? It seems when you actually open up the Bible and show them, guys. Your your leaders either have no clue what they're talking about, in which case, why should you be listening to them? Or they do know what they're talking about, and they're deliberately trying to deceive you, in which case, why are you listening to them? Yeah. There are Muslims who will start to look at that and start to be bothered by that. There are Muslims who will look at that and say, wow, maybe I shouldn't be listening to this guy. But in general, it just doesn't seem to bother them much, right? You can show, hey, I will show you over and over again that your leaders are lying to you about Islam and they're lying to you about the Bible. They're lying to you about Jesus. They're lying to you about Muhammad. They're doing whatever they can. They will say absolutely anything to keep you faithfully believing in Islam, no matter what kind of lies they have to tell you. And many Muslims just don't seem to care, right? I mean, they just don't seem to care. Like, like, like the Muslims who bring this up, if they had an ounce of concern for the truth, when they just heard you go through those verses, they should immediately say, wow, I will never bring up this objection again. And the people I heard this objection from, I can't really trust anymore. Unless they were, unless, unless this was the only thing they had wrong and they were just using a bad argument and didn't realize how bad it was. Um, but uh, until I have some reason to trust these guys again, if they're misleading me this badly about the Bible, I can't really trust them anymore. But for some reason, they just, it doesn't, it, in other words, it, it seems like Islam instills in Muslim leaders um, a willingness to deceive, but it also instills in many Muslims in the Muslim population. Again, there are, there are plenty of exceptions. I've seen many Muslims who you refute their argument and they'll actually pay attention to the refutation. But it, it does seem to instill in many, many followers of Islam just a willingness to be deceived, right? Like, I don't care if this guy's deceiving me as long as he's doing it in the name of Islam. I don't care if he's deceiving me about the Bible as long as he's doing it for the good of Islam. Yeah, yeah. Very you, know, you know, David, Yeah, it proves what the Bible says, that at the end of the day, it has to be a spiritual power blinding them, influencing them, misleading them, so that really our apologetics has to be coupled with intense prayer for them and fasting, so that the Holy Spirit, who's almighty and much greater than these evil spirits working through them, <clears throat> will set them free to hear the truth. Because like Paul says, our battle is not with flesh and blood, but powers, principalities, dominions, and the heavenly realm. The fact that they would rather be deceived really shows a strong demonic influence that only the blood of Christ can set them free from. So, you know, they're only proving the truth of Scripture. So Christians, pray for the Muslims and fast for them because it's not apologetics that's going to win them. It's the Holy Spirit using our apologetics as we cry out for them to bring them to the feet of Jesus Christ. So, All right, you know? Sam, uh, I didn't want to let this one slide because we brought it up earlier. So one more quick point here. 
just because sure. I see so many Muslims doing this. Ultimate Truth again says, Sam, did you realize that you just admitted that your God is the author of confusion by saying that Jesus of the Barabbas being in the Bible was confusing? Now, so there are two issues here. One, you have Muslims using this verse about God not being the author of confusion to then say that any time there's anything confusing that, ah, you yeah. see, this, refute, this refutes your belief. Now, Sam, just in context, what is God not being the author of confusion? Because Muslims yes. will even use this against the Trinity, right? Ah, your, your, your Trinity is confusing, but God's not the author of confusion. So therefore, he's not the author of the doctrine of the Trinity or something like that. In context, what does this verse actually mean? And is this how it should be applied? Yeah, and I don't want people to take my word for it. What he's alluding to is 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For, for the love of truth, just read the chapter. And if you don't want to read all the chapter... Start from 26 and read all the way to 36. He's talking about chaos in worship, mm -hmm. disorderly conduct, disorderly worship, where prophets are speaking all at the same time, where people are and praying in tongues all at the no same time. No one can time. understand anything that's being said because Nothing. it's a big, massive confusion. That's right. So the, the, if you go back and look at what it's, it's actually saying, God is not the author, uh, author of chaos. Mm -hmm but he is the God of order and peace. It has nothing to do with whether God's nature is beyond comprehension, and there are things about God we won't fully understand that will perplex our minds. He's talking about orderly conduct and worship. How dare someone misapply that to teach something else? Well, like you said, again, as I said, either there's a willingness to want to be deceived or there's a strong demonic <clears throat> influence and keeping a person from seeing what the past says. So that passage is misapplied. It has nothing to yeah. do with the clarity of Scripture or lack thereof. And, and, and so, and so when, when a Muslim brings up this passage, that's, that's either a Muslim who has no clue what he's talking about, he's never read the passage, yeah. or he knows what the passage means, he's deliberately trying to deceive people. In yeah. either case of which, when a Muslim uses, uh, applies this and says, oh, God is not the author of confusion, therefore... Since you're confused about this, or since that sounds confusing, we need to reject it. Even according to the Bible, this is a person you just shouldn't trust, because obviously the person can be barely literate, right? I mean, anyone can read that passage and see, and see what the Bible is actually saying here. Um, yeah. So to him applying it, saying, hey, there's a textual variance, right? You've got, a textual, you've got textual variance in the Bible. We grant that there are textual variants in the Bible, right? And so a, a textual variant is a place where, well... Lots of textual variants can be, there, there's no dispute about, right? It, it, the, the variants arose later, right? Copyist errors and things like that. Most variants are things like, that don't affect the meaning at all. They're like spelling variants. Like, like the, the, the name John in the New Testament can be spelled with one N or two Ns. And so you'll find these variants. Those are textual variants. Now think about this. If you have one manuscript of the, of the, of the Bible and it spells John with one N and you have another manuscript of the Bible and it spells John with two Ns, um, well, which one was the original? If you say, wow, I don't know. Up, oh, you see that? The Bible's, the Bible's not true because God is not the author of confusion. You're confused right there. He's saying, he's actually applying textual variants and taking a verse that has nothing to do with this sort of situation and saying, ha ha, I've got you. I've stumped you. But just think, right? Because if, if that's actually what that means and he's applying that standard, uh, just tell me. Ubay ibn Kab said that chapter 1, yeah. chapter 113, and chapter 114 aren't supposed to be in the Quran. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Abdullah ibn Masud said that. Uh, yeah. Ubay ibn Kab said that there were two additional chapters. Zayd ibn Thabit said that you should have 114. That's it. Confusion. No, so, and, and, that... and notice notice wh 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 who's, who's right. I don't even know. They, they, they all have they all have arguments for, for for what they're saying, right? I mean, like like uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Masud, his point is, wait a minute. If you, if you take Surat al-Fatiha, the, the Quran is supposed to be Allah talking to us. The Quran is supposed to be Allah speaking to man. Al-Fatiha is us speaking to God, right? How could Allah be reciting this for all eternity? He, who's he talking to there? It doesn't make any sense. So he doesn't want this to be part of the Quran. Well, he has a good argument there. So anyway, the point is, who's right? No one. Right. But, but let, let, let me make the point a bit a bit stronger. Yeah. Were Abdullah ibn Masud and Ubay ibn, Ka, Ubay ibn Kab really the top guys on the Quran? Muhammad said it. He Muhammad goes, thought they were. Yeah. So, but according to modern Muslims, Muhammad must have just been confused. Precisely. And, and God is not the author of confusion. And therefore, he's yeah. not the author of the Quran because it's confusing. And... and <laughs> 
And Sam, just basically yeah. everything we've said today, right? If, uh, if we're talking about um, the Quran commanding Muslims to kill those who don't believe, and but Muslims today will say, no, no, you can't just kill anyone who, who doesn't believe. You don't kill, you don't kill yeah. women or children, right? Because yeah. that's in the Hadith. Well, so the Quran will just confuse you, right? The Quran is just confusing because it just says, kill those who don't believe, right? Qualification. So, yeah, so, so the Quran over and over again is just confusing. In fact, think about this. Sam, according to Surah 3, verse 7, is the Quran that's really, it. really confusing? That's what I was going to say. If oh, okay. Yeah, and, and again, you, you see, you're thinking just like where, what I, where I want to take this. Since the Quran says, 3, 7, there are a set of passages confusing, ambiguous, no one knows their meaning, we can thank our Muslim friend for using 1 Corinthians 14.33, the words of Paul, mind you, to condemn the Quran and Muhammad, because definitely the Quran cannot be from God, which it isn't, and Muhammad can't be a prophet. So thank you for proving too much again. Mm -hmm. That was my point earlier, when they use arguments and consistently do not think about the implications mm -hmm. of their arguments. Thank and, you. And, 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 and they really don't, right? It's always, how can I attack Christianity at this moment? <laughs> and I, I will never even bother to think for even a second about how this would apply uh, to uh, to Islam as well. Um, but just wanted to, I just wanted to bring up this this extra comment here because it relates. Uh, Medic for Christ said, uh, "Have you heard of the double slit experiment and how a photon or light can behave as both a wave and a particle at the yeah. same time? Not imaginable to humans as true uh, to to humans true like the Trinity." Um, but yeah, so, so notice, and, and I just wanted to apply it to what was just said. So we can't understand how light can behave as both a wave and a particle. You would think it has to be, it has to be one or the other. Uh, yeah. But there are experiments to show that, that light behaves as both a wave and as a particle. So notice, now our Muslim friend would have to say, well, God's not the author of confusion, therefore God didn't create light. I wonder who did. Because it's confusing. So, so now he has to... Now he has to throw out science, and he yeah. has to believe that God is not the creator. So yeah. this is some amazing by, stuff. By the way, I just want to make clear, mm -hmm. I didn't say that the word Jesus Barabbas is confusing. I conjecture, I said, mm -hmm. if it was removed, yeah. it may have been removed because a scribe thought it may have confused someone. Mm -hmm. Just because he thought that doesn't mean the text is confusing, because contextually it is clear which Jesus was crucified. So mm -hmm. he even took my words and twisted them to imply something I didn't intend to imply. So I just want to make that clear. I don't believe that, Sam. I don't believe that someone would, would uh, twist your words. No, never. Never. Come on. Islam is the religion of truth. What are you talking about, buddy? <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, we've uh, we've gone a yep. few minutes uh, over here, but uh, Sam and I have, have been talking and we're thinking that we, we might go live. Um, what did we say? Sundays, yeah, Lord willing, and, Sundays and Wednesday nights? Yeah. yeah, this Wednesday I'm in town, so I'll be good. I mean, I, I come back Tuesday. So Wednesday, I'm good by the grace of God. Okay, so our, our plan, our plan, and this is subject to change. We both have families. We both have, uh, yeah. we, we both have you know, kids running around and, and other things we have to do. So this, this could change. But as of right now, our plan for the near future is to go live about 8 o'clock in the evening. Uh, Eastern, Eastern time. time. Yeah. I want to remember that. Eastern that's, time that's nice. on so, Sundays and Wednesdays. We'll be taking live questions. Uh, please invite your uh, your Muslim friends. In fact, I mean, if you've got Muslim friends and they've got some issues they'd like to discuss, just say, "Hey, let's go sit in front of the computer uh, Sunday and Wednesday night, and we'll bring up we'll bring up uh, we'll bring up the questions. We'll be happy to um, happy to address those." So uh, um, if you if you get a chance, subscribe to Sam's channel. It's the Shamunian channel. I put that in the description box. Uh, if you want to support Sam so he can do this more often and join me more regularly, um, jump in for a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars on his Patreon account. I understand there's some issues with uh, Patreon's uh, direction that they're going and probably won't be a, a safe platform for us to be on. Uh, I heard from a couple people today who uh, are proposing uh, an alternative to Patreon where th they will they will protect everyone's free speech rights. That's coming from uh, Dave Rubin and, and Jordan Peterson. So uh, they're going to be working on that. So, I, I mean, I really hope. See, yeah. I liked Patreon up until the past few months, up until the past several months, right? I, I liked Patreon. It was a great platform. It was great to have people say, hey, we want to hear more of what this person has to say. So we're willing to fund this person. This is uh, allowing people to, to, to promote the speakers that they 
uh, want to promote on, on various platforms. And so Patreon was, was really awesome for helping at that. And so I hope that they actually look at some of the, some of the choices they've made over the past few months. Uh, go to the people who made these choices, fire them, or tell them, hey, you need to, you need to stick to some better policies. Um, we, we ho- I hope that we see them redeemed, right? I would like to see people continue using Patreon. I would like to see that continue being used as a platform. With that said, if they keep going on this path and do not correct their mistakes, we'll probably be migrating to a safer platform in the, pu- in the future. But in the meantime, in the meantime, um, I would love to see people like uh, Sam and Anthony Rogers and others uh, be online at night for Muslims to, to challenge uh, regularly because it does take time. You've seen, you've seen uh, Muslims who are indoctrinated by their leaders. It takes time to kind of break through that. They have to see it over and over and over again that their, their leaders have been misleading them. So we want to do that, and uh, we're going to be here. And yep. so, uh, again, uh, j- just jump on uh, Sam's Patreon for now and sign up for a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever a month. And uh, that will that will help him out a lot. All right. And so we'll see everyone here next time. Uh, just unless- pray for us, Dave. Just say pray intensely for us. We need yes, their yes. God will protect our families and fight for us for the glory of Jesus. So don't stop praying. That's what we need more than anything. Amen. So- and uh, so we'll all we'll in theory be back, Lord willing, uh, this Wednesday, eight o'clock p.m. And hope to see everyone back then.